Alright, let's get on with it. Howdy, how's it going man? Welcome guys, my name is James and today we are going to be doing some more group studies as we do every single day that we can manage on the channel. Today our subject is, we're going to do this bird first. This bird's going to be our 45 minute study and perhaps this one will be an R, maybe an R and 15. We want to capture some of that uh, cloth rendering there. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it for today's stream. I might consider doing some portfolio stuff on stream. Uh, but most likely I will not, because I think I would still uh, like to maintain a good amount of focus when I do that work. But I have a lot of work to do tonight, and I have a very early appointment tomorrow, because I need to go write um, an English qualification exam, which I don't plan on preparing for, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not very uh, unconfident with my uh, ability to explain things in English, so I should be able to excel at that exam without too much incumbent. Uh, however, I do need to wake up really early, so... I'm going to have to do a lot of work uh, tomorrow because most of the day is going to go into that exam because four hours of an exam and then about two and a half hours of transit. And after that, I have uh, a mentorship session in the evening. So my day tomorrow is going to be quite packed. Maybe I can postpone my mentorship to Sunday. That would be nice. Maybe I should ask the person. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But for now, let's not uh, overcomplicate things. For now, the objective our purpose in this current ephemeral epoch of time is simply to get this study done. Focus on that real quickly. Let me quickly organize things that I have on my screen here. Make sure everything is alright. Amsher though, welcome, good to see you. Alright, so this falcon, we have done many and more birds in the past and the birds are quite simple, we do enjoy doing them and what a better way to start the stream than the quite, uh, it's quite simple like this. Some uh, things to point out, the direction of the light source coming from this way and how you check the light source, there's a multiple ways of doing it. Maybe you can actually see the light source in the uh, in the image. But of course, the major giveaway, the dead giveaway, is shadows, especially the cast shadows, right? I mean, you can try and search around for form shadows, but sometimes uh, they become quite subtle. For example, there's a subtle, subtle form shadow around this entire region. But we can't particularly see that, can we? Because unless you're looking for it, I mean, unless you knew the shape of this object or the bird, we won't be able to see that but these car shadows very very clear very evident we know where it's coming from also these highlights as well very clear indication there it should be pointed out that a highlight is a non-static uh, value on top of objects because the highlight can change depending on where you stand because you have to understand what the highlight is doing is the source is reflecting off of this object and that lights coming off of this object into your eyes and that's where the highlight is so the funny thing about that is that the highlight can actually move depending on which perspective you're viewing the object in, which is kind of cool, isn't it? It's kind of cool thing to think about. Adi, thank you for the sub, man. I'm glad you're enjoying the content. And that's an interesting thing to note because most other things are not static. For example, a cast shadow will still be in the same direction, right? Here's another cool tip about cast shadow, by the way. 
Uh, it's an interesting thing to think about, and I've been thinking about this myself lately. If you think about some sort of protrusion, right, coming outward, or any shadow, let's just draw something simple, like a cube, right? Let's draw a simple cube. So what happens, generally speaking, is when we try to calculate the shadow or the cast shadow from a place, it's kind of cool in that if we just consider the direction of the light source, we can actually split this whole directional vector up into two different different types, right? We can just split this up into a few vectors, like we can talk about the magnitude coming in this way. So this way meaning that I should have light coming from this way. So I'll extend these little vertices of my object, and then all I have to do is sort of combine this angle, this angle from up here, and I can actually draw out the cast shadow of any object using this kind of method. So kind of s separating out the direction and like at least the two directions, so the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. And doing this will really help you kind of figure out your cast shadows really quickly, so then you can immediately evaluate where your cast Which is a kind of fun way of doing it, right? It's a simple matter of extension and then calculate the angle at that particular point. Of course, it might be a little bit too, like, unnecessarily technical, and in most cases it probably will be. But let's say you're drawing something that you have no idea about, and you want to be really accurate with the shadows, then this kind of thing multiplied by a few levels of complexity can really help, I guess. That's a kind of cool thing to consider. Okay, let's move on. Let's gonna do, we're going to do study night right now. Oh my goodness, I'm all flustered. I slept for an excessive amount of time yesterday. So somewhat, uh, I'm somewhat regret, because even though sleep is good and I probably needed it, what I do not like is not getting any work done, so we're going to double, triple down on the work today. Most of that, most of that's going to happen off stream, but... Hey, Copica, thank you for the follow, man. I appreciate you. I'm not quite sure why the alert didn't trigger. Am I just super early, the alert? Are my alerts just turned off? Hopefully they're not. Fortunate if they are. Oh, well, this is part of my stream elements thing, so... And also my sub thing went... I assume it's okay. Thank you, man. Okay. Let's do the study. My major focus of this particular study is going to be just... For oh, Jesus! Ah, thanks for the sub, dude. Appreciate you. Thank you for your continued support. So the colors almost seem a little bit blown out, don't they? They seem to be excessively saturated. Like the amount of blue and the amount of yellow over here, I don't think so. I don't think that's my... That, I mean, it could be very well available in nature, but it does seem like it's slightly touched up. But hey, let's uh, let's just say screw it and kind of match it, right? So what is actually going to be the focus of the study? I think form, for me particularly, because I need to draw a few falcons uh, for some later work. So it's going to be kind of... I need, need to just put a little bit more focus on the... Uh, actual form of the falcon and maybe pay attention to exactly what the simple forms look like. And by simple forms, I mean there's a big old tapering cylindrical form right here that form, forms the, uh, the overall body. How do I know this? It's based on the light and the way that light affects it. We know that this, this isn't a sharp angle. For example, if I was to draw a profile of this particular bird from the left, you can almost evaluate the profile from what you see based on how it reacts to light. So we can tell immediately that maybe the head is more of a squarish form, right? I think if I draw it in the same perspective as the reference, the head looks like this, right? And how can we tell? We can tell because when the shadows cast over here, or when lights cast over here, the top plane goes immediately into the light, right? Top plane goes straight up into the light. So you have that light top plane. And the right plane goes immediately to, to something of a dark, right? So maybe a slight little modification to the shape would be like this. Like that. This little plane, it's like a prism, a rectangular prism. This plane goes somewhat into the light, but not that much. And then the bottom plane of it, when it tapers inwards that way, that bottom plane goes heavily into the dark. You see that right there? It goes heavily into the dark. That's not a discoloration of the skin. That's a shadow, right? That's a, it's a form shadow. So that's how you would simplify the form. So when you're drawing a bird like this, essentially what you would be thinking about is trying to get these two prisms sort of lined up. So same thing happens with the beak as well. So the beak as well is like one big prism like this. This kind of idea. So I drew uh, two of the sides of it. The other side looks like this. Probably you're drawing through some of these shapes. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. But that kind of thing. Which means that these top planes will be in light, these bottom planes will be in shadow, and indeed we do see top planes in light, bottom planes in shadow. A slight little modification there, but that I consider as a detail. But if we were to include that in our simplified drawing, it would look like this. So a slight little bump right there. So as opposed to it looking like this, not particularly this shape. It's more like this shape. 
with, with a little bit of a bevel right here. So it's, it one step bevels that way, and then it goes down. So there's a turn right there, it goes straight this direction, it turns and it goes that way. So when light hits it, you have a little bit of a light on top right there, like that. And then you have shadow coming down below, and then you have the rest of the light on top here. That sort of idea. A little bit of a bevel. So yeah, form breakdowns is what I'm going to be concerned about. So I might spend a little bit more time in the line stage. Let me quickly mute that, my bad. All unprofessional. Okay. So the time for this particular painting is going to be 45 minutes. Got the timer in just a few. You are welcome to get this reference from Discord as well as all the other references. If you are new here, some examples of the work that we've been doing together over the course of the last few months. Um, these are just random little spits. I think overall in terms of studies, we've done, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 overall uh, in the last like a couple of months. So we've been doing a lot of work and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's been a lot of fun. Doing that kind of volume is really, really uh, for growth. And as well as that, we've been doing our own little painting to really, really try to exemplify exactly what we've learned, as well as try to evaluate exactly where we're going faulty, right? Because what's what's a better way of checking where you were really missing? Like, how do you check what you need to what you need to do next? You know, how you check that is you try and test out your information. So either get it evaluated by somebody better than you, or just simply try and do something from imagination or challenge yourself with a piece that you have never drawn before, or something you haven't have never ever tried before, and then see whether the fundamentals that you've learned allow you to get a successful piece. And if not, it requires more attention. Okay, take a drink of water and then we begin. <laughs> Abs says I eat too much ice cream help. Sorry about that, Abs. I'm gonna have to burn it off tomorrow. Okay guys, three, two, one, and we go. Study begins. I'm gonna just put a slight little indication of the background, but then we're gonna just jump straight into into the measurement and the proportioning and all that good stuff. I'm gonna think about adding a slight little gradient. So what I do whenever I add any sense of color onto any canvas is I test. And I don't test for too long, mind you. I pick something that is relatively close to what I want, and then I stick with it. Mainly because we have to focus with a little bit of a sense of time, right? Because we don't want to spend arbitrarily large amounts of time on things that are ultimately not that important to the overall read of the drawing. Now, this might be a consideration to be made strictly for time studies. However, you need to consider this for most work that you do, because this comes under the overall category of prioritization. And prioritizing work is very good, because you don't want to spend way too much time on things that you don't particularly think are important for the drawing because ultimately that means that you're spending more time than you need to on the drawing as a whole which means that you're not going to have time for more drawings not, not that you won't draw more drawings but you won't have as much time as more that's one of the biggest benefits of getting faster right if you get faster then you're able to put more time and get more work out there and that's just always always helpful having that great volume ultimately is what really brings us to that level of professionalism that most of us crave for Oh, Mir, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Okay, okay. Okay, let me just quickly average out some of these ideas over here because, again, I painted, painted that with a very, very harsh brush and I don't want that degree of harshness to be on my canvas for too long, so therefore get rid of it with a little bit of that softening. Can't join in, maybe next study. Maybe next study, yeah, we're going to be doing a slightly longer one. Well, add some little hints of green there. Again, I test once and then I test again, and hopefully between those two tests, I got something a bit closer. Right now, if to make a little bit of an addendum to the value, maybe I'll add a bit more yellow to it. Make that yellow, it kind of helps, right? That yeah, kind of warmish yellow green because this entire drawing is in kind of intense warm light and the shadows themselves are somewhat cool because there's diffused light and there's uh, this cast light, I'm sorry, this direct light from the sun. So generally speaking, when things are in reality especially, it's somewhat like trivial to kind of determine what the color temperature of sources are sometimes. Mainly because like the sun, we know what, what color temperature the sun is. It's usually yellow or warm. Oh, it depends on the condition, of course. If it's midday, let's say, you can expect it to be yellowish and warmish. Especially when a picture is taken like this, when it's a very, very bright sky outside, we can always expect to be two major, major sources. The first source, of course, is the sun itself. And the second source is always going to be the diffused light from the sky. And that's a really interesting thing. Because that's one of those things that either you know and your paintings benefit from it, or you don't know it and your paintings suffer from it. 
Because I didn't know this for the longest time. I, I could never figure out the concept of diffuse light. And then very recently, I took a course by Craig Mullins on schoolism. And he kind of glossed over it. He was like, yeah, of course, this is your diffuse light. And I was like, wait a second, what? What, what is that? What did you just talk about? What is that? I have no idea what that is. And it turns out that diffused light is one of those really, really important things when you're trying to render something realistically, because this is one other the separate light source, right? So if you ever were told the critique of, oh, well, you need to have uh, warm lights and cool shadows, or cool lights and warm shadows, well, where is the temperature coming from in the shadows? Because temperature, I mean, sure, the local value, of course, has an influence over the temperature, but to the degree, like to have like straight up purples on a local color brown, like where is it coming from? Why do you have to cool up your shadows? Well, it turns out the answer to a question is indeed residing in that diffuse light idea. So the diffuse light will really, really dictate a lot about that. So basically what that means, and I'll explain this in a second with some more, uh, more piece of information, but the diffuse light is essentially, when you consider the hemisphere of the sky, or the hemisphere of a, not just the hemisphere, but the uh, the ambient reflective surface of a room, or whenever you consider it a closed surface, because everything is technically closed, like even the, the even the world around us is technically technically closed by the atmosphere around us. All of these things also scatter and also you know are affected by the light and propagate the light, right? So they act as secondary sources, and whenever they act as secondary sources, the light that comes from those sources takes on a characteristic. Let's take the biggest example available to us, which is the hemisphere of the sky. So the sky itself, see how blue and beautiful the sky can be sometimes? Well, it's it's blue and it's reflecting light, but that light, it has to go somewhere, right? It has to go somewhere. And where it goes is in the shadows. Because even though it is the, it's a very large light source, right? A very large hemispherical light source is all around us, basically. It can't really affect us too much in the region that the light affects us in. Because light is still way stronger. Direct light that goes through the atmosphere is way, way more powerful than the light that gets absorbed and then, you know, propagated secondary to the atmosphere. It's just way more powerful. So you're not going to see this blueness within the area of the light. However, in the area of the shadow, that's when the diffuse light can really play. So when you're considering any sort of painting, don't worry about the diffuse light or whatever in your area of, like, majority light. Because it's going to be simply influenced by your primary light source. However, in the shadow, in the shadows of your drawing, that's why it's really going to be important to consider every, every light source that is not as powerful as your primary. Now, of course, there is such a thing as competing light sources where light sources have a, you know, have an effective sort of hierarchy with it between the two of them and they're somewhat, somewhat equally powerful. But for paintings in general, you don't really want to have competing light sources. It doesn't tend to look all that good because that, that amount of visual clarity, at least, at least some amount of visual clarity is lost. And you consider light sources that compete. Of course, mixing is a thing, and I do encourage you. One of the crits that I get very often on my pieces is that I forget to mix my light sources. And we can get into what that means if it ever comes up uh, organically. But um, overall, you do want a strong sense of clarity. That's why when you're composing pieces from, imag from imagination, it's really, really important for you to consider... It's really important for you to consider having one primary light, primary light source, like one light source that's distinctly stronger than the other one. Really, really important. Because if not, again, you kind of miss out on some clarity. Some clarity in the uh, in the piece, because when things are competing, it's hard to kind of get a direction, a clear like focus on the piece, and everything kind of s simply is a little bit less effective than it could be, is the idea. So it's good to have a nice little hierarchy right there. Right now I'm just doing a casual little block in. Evaluate the most evident points over here. For example, I can get this halfway and I can figure exactly where this starts to taper in because it does indeed taper in. The taper in is a pretty important point. And of course, this is foreshortened against us. This one over here, maybe cut that a little bit over here. I'm being very deliberate with these strokes. Like that, maybe. Of course, here we have that lovely little interaction here with this beak going all the way up. There's a very clear negative space over here. That'll really help me place my beak when I eventually end up drawing it. So nice little square shapes here, starting out nice and simple. So why do we start this simple and paint this like this? Is because that when you start this simple, when you start this fundamental, it becomes incredibly trivial, not trivial particularly, but it becomes far easier to kind of take into account exactly what's happening and make you know very effective decisions based on that. Because if you draw a billion different things in your canvas, 
it can be really hard to kind of figure out exactly what's going wrong, what's working, what's not working. When you keep things nice, straight, and kind of blockish at the very beginning, it'll really up your effectiveness in a piece in terms of your measurement because having a lot of control at this stage is so much more important than having things look accurate. Because accuracy is the end goal, sure, I agree with that. But in order to achieve that accuracy, you need to have a lot, a lot of control over exactly what you're doing. And it turns out that you don't need to do everything in incredible amounts of detail. In fact, I almost discourage you from doing that because if you kind of add incredible amounts of detail, then it becomes incredibly hard to decipher whether or not you've done things correctly or not because there's so much information in the canvas, there's so much more to parse, and ultimately it becomes all that more difficult for you to really objectively say, well, I think I did that accurately. Yeah, that inaccurately. It becomes harder to say this over and over again. It becomes harder. That's something worth thinking about. It's almost incredible. And I always, always talk about what's wrong with my mic today. Nothing should be wrong. It should be all okay. Unless I'm feeding through the wrong microphone. I wasn't checked. No, it should be perfectly fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Nothing should be. I haven't changed anything on my end. Okay, evaluate some more little micro shapes over there. For example, we can just make a simple equation over here. The sound is strange, really. I don't know if that improved it. Give me a quick one too. How's it going, Ninja? I did accidentally drop this microphone yesterday, so I hopefully didn't do too much damage to it. That would be unfortunate. Better now. I unplugged and replugged it. Hopefully it's, uh, it's okay. Better? Okay. Thanks for mentioning something about that, Ali. Okay, we can continue. Hopefully. Okay, and now make some more evaluations here. Also guys, join in on the study if you can. It's useful. <laughs> Teach me, how's it going, Flops? Good old turn off on, on again? Exactly, man. It's, uh, that's seven years of engineering uh, experience right there. Culminating in just that. Okay, so all we have to do is evaluate those basic shapes. People kind of jump the gun on this way too much, but draw things really basically, draw things really square, and draw things with a notion of, okay, I want to be able to control this. Right? That's a really, really big thing you have to wonder about. Because if you're able to objectively control something with a strong, strong degree of control, that's going to really aid you in trying to get effective proportions. Because you never want to be like, oh, I can't, I just can't see what I'm doing wrong. So when it comes to the idea of a process, I mean, doing anything, when it comes to the idea of process, your process should be able to assuage the things that you are particularly bad at, you're inclined to do badly. That should be the overall goal of every process. So if you think for whatever reason that your proportions always keep you down, then you should be strongly considering addressing that little issue right here as simply as you can. How's it going, Sue? It's so good to have you in here. So again, we make some conclusions. I'm going to make some slight little corrections over here. I, I might even do these lines a little bit harder, you know, because these are the, the final lines. So the thing is, you have to notice that I'm doing corrections while I paint over here. But the idea here, at least in the process that it, it stands right now, my idea is... I don't try and get things incredibly perfect and accurate at the very beginning. I simply try to have this, this kind of stage in process where it guarantees me that eventually I will end up, you know, in some something that's mildly accurate. And in not that much time either, right? Even though I'm spending a shit ton of time right now explaining this. I mean, the point is being nice and deliberate with things always, always has a benefit. And keeping things really simple also has a really ben big benefit, right? Like I said before, the greatest artists of our age, right? You talk about the, the Kopinskis, the, the, um, the Andrew Tischlers, the Cesar Santoses. Like these crazy, crazy artists are absolutely insane with their work. Like all these professional portrait artists, people that really value proportions, right? Because I include the idea of 
um, a resemblance, right? A resemblance into the idea of proportion. So these people being absolutely crazy, even these people spend so, so careful amounts of time on these proportions. And also, not just time on the proportion, but they're so basic with it. Like, they spend, they spend time on it, sure, but they're just so incredibly simple with it, which is awesome. It's good to see. So what that tells us is that we can't just jump into these crazy amounts of complication on the get-go. It's not going to serve us too much. What we can do, however, be as rudimentary but as deliberate as we can. Eventually that gets us into something all accurate. Do let me know if there's any more problems with the, the hardware. I haven't done any checks. I used to do daily checks, but the thing is, Sometimes when I'm stuck for time, I can't just uh, I can't spend time on them. Thankfully, things like the internet and all that stuff haven't been bugging us recently, which is awesome. We'll be shifting residence sometime at the end of this month. Hopefully, my new place is going to have decent enough internet. I'll try and make sure about that. I'd have to spend a little bit extra moolah, but I'm sure I can afford it. Hopefully. But yeah, they might there's gonna be a slight little disruption in streams at the end of uh, at the end of this month. Something around the twenty-fifth, I'd say. But um beyond that we should go with everything. Should be all fine. Okay. Let's get started with the painting. So I'm gonna first block this in. reason we block things in is because we again want this to be nice and separate. I don't want this kind of dullish green idea permeating through my canvas. That's going to really kill some of my read and also I want this to be completely separate especially because I like to work in texture. When you work in texture ultimately where does texture even come from? Texture comes from that edge quality right of a lot of the brushes and the edge quality means that you don't have this crazy blocky nature of everything that you paint with. So what that means is it lets something underneath kind of show through as opposed to just block out everything in one strict little little shape. So if it lets things bleed through, what that means is that if you have the wrong thing underneath, the wrong thing could bleed through and you don't want that. So it's very good, especially when you work from right off the bat with texture like I do sometimes. At this stage, really, really good idea is just to kind of block things in with a neutral value. Something like this, you know, just block things in neutrally. So that's not a neutral value over here because the value is way too dark. And defeats a purpose or something like this just vaguely in the in the realm of possibility for certain areas like this would be a good example for the bottom and the same thing up for the top right so a neutral sort of warmish down there and the neutral darkish blue up here again it's just in the, in the notion of just separation that's all this is for here if you're wondering how i'm altering my selection it's just using shift and then using alt shift adds to a selection and alt removes from a selection also control h Get through your selection lines entirely so you can just freely paint inside without having to worry about those terrible, terrible squiggly lines on the side. Good little examples for selection usage. It's a fun thing to do as well. And now, even when you have a selection, you can do a lot of, a lot of like really cool things. Are you getting from the color from your reference or from your palette? From my palette, the palette's right here. You can't see it, but it's there. I highly discourage sampling from your reference, especially when you're trying to learn color. I mean, initially, I have no issue with it, right? Because if you're an absolute beginner, there's no issue whatsoever with sampling. I do encourage it. But when you're doing these things, please do these things with a notion of trying to learn, right? Because if, if we don't think about why, if we don't justify the why, it kind of makes us a bit more, you know, it, it kind of affects us, generally speaking, when it comes to our own ability to pick effective colors. So do everything with a notion of learning. Because if you're unable to justify the why or figure out exactly what the color is, we don't train our eye, we don't train our ability to figure out good color theory, and what does that leave us with? Clear split. What that leaves us with is this, this notion of always using the reference as a crutch. And what if the reference itself isn't that attractive, you know? That's a really important question to ask. What if the reference, what if the thing we're trying to reference isn't something that exists in reality? Well, then we're high, we're really out of luck, right? Because we can't paint that, that means. And we don't ever want to be in a situation where we can't paint something. So again, in the notion of learning, the notion of getting better, it's perfectly, perfectly fine. Sample. You to trace or do whatever you want to as long as you're very forthcoming with it as long as you don't try to pass work off as as your own when it's you know just a carbon copy of something else but if you're learning it's no problem there's nothing wrong with, with 
tracing or doing anything if you're learning. And right now, I'm not going to benefit too much from tracing. I'm not going to benefit too much from color picking, right? And uh, arguably, I would say it's you can only get a l only so much from the idea of color picking from tracing. Otherwise, it becomes a crutch. You don't want it to be a crutch, right? You don't want these kind of things to be a crutch. Otherwise, it really impedes learning. And learning is, is exactly what we're trying to get at this point in our little, little art journey here. We want to figure out the why of things, be able to justify things. We want to be able to figure things out for ourselves. But definitely, at the very beginning, without any basis whatsoever, without any sort of training whatsoever, it can be difficult to do these kind of things, which is why I'll never be one of those people that says never trace, uh, never color pick. I mean, if it helps you, then who am I to say that it's, it's pointless and that it's not something you're supposed to do? Should you always do that? Should you do that, you know, well along your learning? Of course not, because there are far, far more effective things you could be doing with your time. But the very initial, initial advent of it, it's fine. It's okay. You can do whatever you think is effective. It's important to establish that strong structure at this point straight up, right? So again, I'm going to add nice little blocky splotches of color. And I want to give that notion of, okay, this is a cylindrical form and slowly it tapers into this warm, warm shadow underneath. The image right here, near the left organize things in that, that respect and then this this over here as well is going to go into a cast shadow here but that cast shadow is going to be the cast shadow of this color but it's going to go way into the darkness and that little shadow interestingly enough is not going to be hit by any diffuse light so i don't need to cool it up so these kind of questions you won't be able to answer i feel like unless uh genuinely like really think about why things are there because you have to understand that when it comes to, to picking things off of a reference, when it comes to using existing things, it's it's perfectly fine to. But what you're doing when you're doing that is saying, okay, fine, I am not ready to really think about this just yet. I'm just going to use the reference of the training wheel, right? And that's perfectly fine because you might be focused on other things entirely, which is it's okay. I mean, even master painters uh, will eventually like they'll start tracing, for example, if all they care about is painting, because you know they've done what they want to do for proportions and they don't want to waste time. They just want to jump directly into the painting, which is fine. I have no issue with that. But by tracing for like painting with color directly picked and not thinking about it, you're making the choice willingly to say, okay, well, I do not want to learn anything about the color of this piece. I just want to simply use it for my rendering. And, you know, in a lot of respects, that's perfectly fine, right? Because if you want to make that kind of claim and be honest about it, that's no problem whatsoever. But the thing is, you're, it's hindering it's hindering whatever you can get from the piece by making that kind of... Uh... There's so much to learn on color, right? So much to figure out. So we've done so many pieces for and I still don't know all that much about it, but I know way more than I began with. That's kind of the point of learning, right? So yeah. But to summarize that whole little uh, whole little spiel, it always comes down to use things, you know, if they are effective for your learning, but then never use things as a crutch. Using it as a crutch does you no favors. We don't want to be tracing forever, we don't want to be picking forever. Come to a time where we're able to pick our own little colors for a piece and have fun with it, to make things our own. That's not uh, something that's really possible if all we do is pick. And picking itself, it has like, there's more to do with picking than one might think, you know, there's more to it than just picking out the same reference. A lot of painters, right, a lot of concept painters will pick off multiple references and put it in an entirely new piece. And I think that's perfectly fine because again, you have a deadline to meet. But there's so many like little pieces of information there. So yeah, it's, it's definitely really hard to outlaw something altogether, but just be honest about the reason you're using it and make sure that it's consistent with your own personal goals when it comes to whatever you're doing. I think that's probably the best way of putting it. Like if it meets your own personal goals about it, then go ahead and do it. Because I'm not going to say everybody in here wants to be a professional artist one day. I doubt I, most of you want to be professional. And there's nothing wrong with that, man. Professional art is a, is a fucking, it's horrible sometimes, right? I mean, it's something that I personally want to do, you know, more than anything else. But to say that that's something that you should be able to do or should want to do is ridiculous because the industry is so cutthroat. The deadlines are so ridiculous. The requirements are stupendous. The stability in terms of your job is, is so terrible. The job security is not that good. The amount of employment opportunities like there's so many reasons not to right so ultimately if you just want to draw and have fun i mean whatever you want to do highly encourage it
How's it going, Bonnie? More birds? Yes, indeed. I'm drawing this Peregrine Falcon. Probably gonna have a, a bird character in my uh, in my portfolio. It was supposed to be a dragon character, like this lead dragon character, but honestly, with the creature concepting that I've been doing in my sketchbook, I'm not very enthused about it because all of it looks so derivative. I don't like it. So I might have this like weird bird character, hopefully. Cool one? It is pretty cool. Follow Bonnie, by the way. Follow Miscellaneous Candy Art. My buddies here on Twitch. Good, good friend of mine. A fellow artist, go check out her work. Also, if you see her in my chat, make sure you spam my bag emote because that's what I made for her. Just a big fan of bags in general. There's really a uh, marvel at their ability to hold things and in them. How's it going, Bonnie? I was about to post the bag, but I suddenly changed my mind. Okay. Let's get that car shadow out of the way really quickly, right? Get that strong little car shadow. Because if we don't do this now, we're never going to do it. You have to understand. If I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. And car shadows are, are really not that hard to think about, you know? Just, just go go out of your way and just do it. You know, and then work, make the piece work around it. Because we've got to make these, these kind of changes really, really harshly. Because otherwise we kind of peter around it too much. Be an integrated part of your piece. Like oftentimes people will have this issue where they'll make a change in their, their drawing and the change is just so inconsequential that it doesn't look strong enough. And that's just a hallmark of being new to something, right? Because I've seen this time and time again in my work, in people's work that are crit, just at different levels. For example, I can show you a really good example of this later, uh, but uh, silhouettes, for example, I'm new to the idea of doing like a lot of silhouettes in a small amount of time. And you should see, I make the same mistake that people do when they make mistakes with their values, which is, Things that are light are kind of light, things that are dark are kind of dark, but nothing is like effectively committed on the piece. It's a very non-committed piece. And that's exactly, doesn't that sound exactly like the same mistake people make when it comes to like anything when they're a beginner, right? Because things aren't as strongly defined. Like the, the most common crits you'll hear as a beginner is, oh, well, your values could be improved. You could strengthen your values. You're missing your lights, you're missing your darks. You know, your edges are a bit too hard everywhere. Your edges are a bit too soft everywhere. Your colors are way too saturated, your colors are way too desaturated. Does any of the sound familiar? Because that's the most common thing that we hear, but what is ultimately, when you evaluate that, what exactly is the problem at the end of the day? The problem is, is that the things that need to have this degree of moderation or this degree of excessiveness, those are somewhat confused sometimes, right? The things that we need to commit on, we're a little half-assed on. And opposite to that, things that we should be kind of somewhat mediated on, somewhat like controlled, those things we kind of floor. So that's exactly like the problem with being new to something. And one of the good, the best pieces of news about that is that there's no problem, there's no issue because it's all solvable. Right? Eventually with experience comes the ability to choose, pick and choose exactly where to be committed and also to be committed about it. Have you ever tried to do a drawing from imagination and you don't do these very often? One of the most primary things you will notice that you get wrong is that your values themselves look super weak and your colors look super boring. And it's a very, very common idea. And why does that really happen? Because if you're uncomfortable with the idea of creating something without, you know, set amounts of like information already presented to us. And that kind of makes our work a bit more ineffective because we're so caught up in thinking about certain things that we forget about the things we already know. And that's fine because with experience comes comfort, with comfort comes the ability to choose how to do things. So it's just a question of doing more. The more we do, the more we learn, the more we learn, the more we do. You're streaming today, right, Bonnie? Isn't it a bit late for you? In here. And one of the best things about that, I gotta tell you, one of the best things about that whole story is that the more things you learn and the more progress you make in certain things, it becomes so much easier because you recognize the same little things over and over again in so many different aspects of what you do. That makes It makes learning in general so much easier. And that's a really, really cool thing because what that ultimately means is that the things that you learn right now as a beginner, these things are the hardest things technically you'll ever have to learn because you have no basis of having learned things before. So therefore, it becomes so much more easier to learn things at this, uh, or so much more hard to learn things at this stage. But every subsequent thing that you learn makes you a better learner in general. And that's awesome. That's really good news. At least, at least to me it is. Because that means that whenever I had an issue with like value or whatever, that's basically the most amount of thought or most amount of like hardship I'm going to face because ultimately right now when I've 
progress enough and I've learned enough things, I'm much, much more comfortable with the idea of learning things. Which is good news, which means that if anybody's having problems in art, these might be the worst problems you've ever faced, you know? These might be, this is probably it, you know? You're not going to have problems that really affect you. You might have more difficult problems, but you're going to be far more capable of handling them when you kind of encounter them. Which is a kind of, it's interesting to think about, right? And the problems now are basically the worst problems you're ever going to experience. Right, Vidya, so hello. So you stream daily? Yes, indeed, sir. This is a daily stream. How's it going, Tens? Dude, the weather, so we always talk about the weather. The weather right now is really weird because I, I didn't feel too sweaty when I first started. When I first started, like, getting up upon the day. But right now, when I stand down to stream after a shower, my goodness, I'm, like, covered with sweat. Like, I might take my shirt off in a second. Awful. Twenty-seven minutes in. But yeah, it's not a fun thing to think about, though. The fact that like the things that we're learning right now might be the most difficult things we ever do. Like, how fun is that? Because that, that's so like relieving to hear. Because when you think that this is all, take off your shirt and let us paint. <laughs> let us paint you. Maybe one day, possible. The sub only benefit. Make sure you sub to the channel. Sam and James are right, you do stream naked? I stream pretty much semi-naked every single day. Like, I'm wearing, a, right now I'm wearing a wife beater and they're really short shorts. So, uh, yeah, basically. Can I unsub? What can I do, man? It's hot as hell here. Want your boy to suffer? I've got a stream for you guys. I've got to be comfortable, come on. Come on, come on now. Let's be honest. Let's be adults about this. Also, we need to stop calling it a wife beat. Ah, it's true. <laughs> I personally actually don't like it. I'm gonna slightly warm this up, right? Add a bit more saturation over here. Yeah, follow, follow my boy Abzi. Abzi Wabzi right there. He's a streamer. He's a dude that does stuff. I wanted to draw today, but my PC kept lagging hard. I had to draw it by hand and trace. That's no problem, dude. You can also scan it. Also, I feel a sneeze coming on. Hopefully you guys don't hear it. See that goes a little bit cooler? It goes a little bit cooler. Now, this is a one of them hot and spicy Indiana Bro tips. When you see things going a little bit cooler, but not cool enough that you can call it a blue, just slap some grey on there. Because greys are so important in painting, man. You gotta have a healthy amount of grey on every canvas. Because that grey is gold. It's gold that you don't know is gold. Because a grey will desaturate. Of course, it's a desaturated color, that's what a grey is. But what it really does is that it warms up a cool and it cools up a warm. And that's powerful. That's really powerful because it becomes super versatile and it becomes that slight little bridge. That slight little bridge towards warmness and coolness. Very subtle amounts of warmness and coolness. And that's awesome to see. It's good to see in general. Because subtlety makes a lot of paintings, right? We want things to be nice and subtle, we want things to be harmonious. So oh, that has been good. I don't want to stay at home. That's perfectly fine, dude. Do what you gotta. It was desaturated and light. This is a group study stream, by the way, guys. I should uh, probably point this out more. I probably have a command going through my stream, but. People do draw here alongside me, I'm no expert in anything, but I do try and host these every single day that I can. And the point of doing these together is we both learn together. So at the end of these, we do review, I do give you guys notes on things that I think uh, could be improved upon, things that I, I know to myself, things that I can improve upon. Nice little thing. Stop calling it grey, it's called desaturated color. When painting IRL, you don't paint grey, use the water dump. Yeah, but when painting digitally, you have the option of just painting it a straight grey, so I can call it a grey. <laughs> Call it desaturated color. Yeah, okay. Nobody got time for that shit. Also, if Charlie calls it a gray, I'm gonna call it a gray. Right? Take it up with them. Nice little subtle notes of gray <laughs> on the canvas. Don't call it water, call it dihydrogen oxide. All right, abs.
Add a bit of light here, a couple of light strokes. I'm drawing this with a super blocky brush, by the way. There's no texture whatsoever in this brush, but I'm having a, such a good time with it. And I'm hard pressed to change this up. I think it would be more educational to say the actual color, Mr. Educational Streamer. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's gray it up. You know what, actually, uh, on that note, what would be really good is if I could show my color picker. But the thing is, when I window catch my color picker, that stuff, it really lags my capture for some reason. Really annoying, because usually, I can show you guys right now. But this is what I'm looking at, if you're curious. So I have my my color selected right here. right? So I'm, I'm going back and forth while I paint to kind of figure things out. Uh, it would be nice if I could capture I could just capture this screen, but the thing is, uh, that would be a more of a, a display capture than a window capture. I don't like that. Always a constant struggle. Have thought about it in the past, but not something that we can really do. Maybe if I had a more powerful setup. Because right now you have to understand I stream on a very shitty laptop. But we try our darndest, right? Guess we'll get the work out there. Make a basic evaluation, check our little values here, and make changes. As you paint, as you complete more and more about your painting, always take a little step back at every little instant of time, whenever you can manage it. Blur your eyes and check whether you think everything is appropriately positioned. The way you do that is you just blur your eyes, right? You just go all the way back, and then you blur your eyes and you ask yourself some questions. Say, am I happy with certain things? Am I okay with certain, uh, certain values? And when things are that blurred out, it becomes easier to answer this question because you're not so caught up in the detail. You now you have a good picture of events, you have a good idea of what's happening. And it's a great place to answer that question because when you're all the way in here and say, okay, what's wrong? It's hard to really tell. When things are zoomed out, it becomes a bit easier. Great place to ask that question. Okay, well I have my nice little structure here, so that's my little goal of the study kind of completed. Probably put those legs in at some point, but yeah, I'm happy enough with that. The next study, by the way, it's going to be a real pain in the ass. It's going to be a person next to a fire. There you go, it's this one over here. That's going to be really fun to do. It's really going to call upon our ability to uh, interact color with light and surface. Which is great. Always fun to do those kind of pieces. I have the problem with Creator that when I want to change the category of my brush, it doesn't do it. Change the category? What do you mean by that? So I didn't change the type of tip, maybe? Or... Let's see if we can figure that out. I'll do this roughly with some selection real quick. There. We have a few people. Oh, to favorite, right. So this actually happens to me as well. Usually sold by a restart. Or sometimes, sometimes it's already on the, uh, it's on my category already. And I just haven't seen it yet. But sometimes indeed, this does bug out. It's a known bug in versions, I think 4.1.8 and onwards. It's a known bug. So that's actually a thing that does happen. So you can duplicate the brush and save the duplicate. Or just double check to see whether or, not, whether or not the brush is already there. Because I have had this issue before. Indeed, it does happen. Nice. How about this little yellow color right there? You go. Look, instant legs. Easy peasy. Yeah, just do double check. Yeah, well, the software is a little bit buggy sometimes. Oddly enough, I saw this YouTube comment section on like a an Aaron Blaze video, and people were saying, oh, I really want to get digital painting, but I can't afford Photoshop. And then somebody said, oh, you should try Krita, it's a great program. And then there was this fucking huge hate thread on like, don't use Krita, use Medibank, Krita's terrible for beginners. And I was like, wait a second, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? 
I didn't realize that it had a negative reputation. Like, what the fuck? I know Krita's buggy, but it isn't, it isn't bad necessarily. I mean, I've done the majority of my learning on Krita. Not all of it. Like, all my painting learning has been done on the software. In break. Not that bad. Not to mention it's fucking free, so... I don't say that you can't argue about things that are free, but still, I mean, consider, be a little bit more considerate. Also, I can add a little bit more information here. My shadow shape. Be a little bit very when you're putting in like little notions of occlusion shadow or ambient occlusion or whatever. Don't use lines for it if you can avoid it, because just the, the presence of a single line can really kill your overall read on a painting, because you want to draw mostly with shapes and not with lines. So when I want to add like a bit of shadow in here, I mostly will just fill it up using a little bit of a shape and then average at the shape. Sometimes people argue for the sake of arguing. I hear that. It's a solid copy from me. There we go. So we have a bit of a con shadow in here. Okay, down here we can just add a few strokes to indicate stuff, but again, down here is not my concern in the painting. Whenever you do a painting in general, it's good to think about the fact that we want to direct the people's attention to the actual area of focus, right? So in that regard, you have to just keep a strong control over exactly how many strokes you put in certain areas. And it should be in accordance with exactly how much attention you want to go in that area, because when it comes to directing focus, now the directing focus is like a big thing, right? That we don't necessarily think about too much because we usually draw from reference in the stream but when it comes to composing your own pieces this is a big deal it's a big deal on how how much you can kind of draw the audience focus like if you take any color and design class or any design class in general when it comes to drawing one of the things you hear over and over again so so often is that they'll say okay i'm doing this because this value over here this shape over here this texture over here is drawing too much attention like the idea of controlling attention becomes so much more important to the people that are drawing it because ultimately that's the point of drawing isn't it so to convey an idea and the stronger you're able to convey that idea the better of an artist that you are that's going to be like the biggest thing you hear over and over again yeah that's what i said abs any design class it over and over and over again That's when things like putting random details in places, or putting random lights in places, or showing focus in areas that don't particularly matter. I mean, these things come come to a head. It's really important. Come and walk my dogs. Have fun. Jesus, somebody's road raging outside. Dude, no problem, Belio. Have a good day, man. Hopefully, I'll catch you in here. I mean, sorry. Meeting with us. Do a few marks here. You ever wake up from a really long nap and you have this unreal amount of mental fog? That's where I'm at right now. Feels blurry, man. But it's something we can manage, right? Nothing too, too bad. You gotta take that test, though. That test's important. But that's not for a, a few more hours. Probably I'm gonna be sleeping between now and the test. If you're wondering what test, I'm taking a, an English qualification exam because I need it for uh, application for certain colleges. Which is always fun. It's called the TOEFL or the TOEFL if you guys ever taken it yourselves. The whole bucket of fun. I've taken the exam once before. I tried it, so I'm not, I'm not even going to try and prepare this time. That was a joke. We have a lot of these little markings here. So maybe, maybe we'll just straight paint some of them, right? a few of these markings. Important that we use local value over here. Just slightly increase the read that I have right there. Put of this darkness. 
When are you doing math here on Twitch? <laughs> math. Makes you say that. You do your math homework on Twitch? Oh, nearly force closed my creator. Be careful. Don't hit that control Q, my man. I want to be a math whiz. Let me know when you get there. I believe in you. Finishing this painting off with a couple of these marks. I'll turn them into strokes down there. I want to be a painter with. I feel like we all we all do, don't we? I'll defocus that in a second. Just adding a couple of those marks initially because I want some broken up marks, and the rest of it I'll just paint in. A little bit of a brush. Would have been maybe smart to do this on a separate layer because I probably would want to adjust the value on top of this. Bit of a note that I need to give myself here. Noise. It'd be a great thing to do a little bit abstractly. I might do one more of these at some point. Like I did with the Harpy Eagle. That was such a lot of fun, man. Not just the Harpy Eagle, but we did one abstract version of the Philippine Eagle, and that was just such, such a lot of fun. Trying to multi-class a math whiz and a paint master? It's, it's gonna work fine. You could maybe even combine those, you know? Be somebody like Escher. Be one of those uh, painters that do like intensely mathematical models. That might be something cool to see. How many? Not too many people do that. Not to mention, if you want to make good cash as an artist, something that people don't talk about all that often is uh, being an artist for... For technical journals and for for textbooks and things like that, you know, people don't generally talk about it. But that's a great play, good way of like earning some amount of living as an artist. Doing technical drawings as well, right? Isn't that a big thing? Of course, that requires more industrial design experience than anything else. But one of those like little fusion courses. How's it going, Glow? Good to see you. I know Nanive in here. Nanive is one of the uh, one of my regulars. He does technical drawing. Which is really, really cool. Hip, yeah, how's it going, dude? Good to see you in here. About to finish this, uh, this little painting here. It looks awesome, thank you. It does look really cool. Add a little bit of darkness here and there. We're pretty much done. And the highlight and we're done.
All right, that's our first one. Oh, where'd the line come from? My goodness. The clean up right there. No speckles? No, nah, no speckles. Like that's it. That's all the time we have for this one. Move on to the next one. Easy as it goes. Oh, I keep hitting my mic. Hold on, let me just move it away because I move it closer to us because people complain that the audio quality is going a bit to shit. Move it a little bit away because I keep bumping into it. Let's crop this, post this, and get started with the next one. If you guys did the study with this, please do submit to the Discord. Put mine on there. I'll bring food, no problem, Glow. Probably gonna be a little bit of a quicker stream because I do have so much work to do. I did think about doing it on stream, but nah, I don't think. Because this heat is <laughs> intolerable. I think I just like to sit with my sketchbook outside somewhere and uh, just get most of it done traditionally. Thank you, DT. Alright, it does not anybody did the study with us, that's perfectly fine. Let us move on to the next one. Because I did start this one a bit earlier. Get the time to jump in. That's perfectly okay. Work done, and then we can move on to the next one. Do a crop. Okay. That's a little blocking right there. Okay, let's just fill in the background real quick. And I'm gonna take a quick little break because I'm covered with wet. So I'm gonna take a break, wipe myself down, and maybe come back with a little bit less clothes. So stay tuned, and we will start this one. Maybe do it for an hour, and that's. Alright, see you in a bit, guys. All right, we are back. There goes Abs clipping again. Just loves to capture material for his own personal use later. All right, let's reset that timer real quick. Make sure everything is ready. Thank you, DT. Okay, 
Also, did you... <laughs> I only saw the title, I can guess what it is. Also, have you guys heard about that uh, the new Twitch thing? There's a new Twitch streaming app that they announced. It's like a very basic version of like OBS, I'm assuming. Probably to um, encourage new streamers on the platform. Not particularly the response I was expecting after this whole mixer debacle, but still. It's something. Welcome back, Glow. Okay, shall we begin on this one? Let's go. Three, two, one. And let's go. First thing that I'll do over here, simply I need to apply a little bit of a gradient on this particular canvas because the light is coming from that direction. I'd like to give myself a little bit of an indication on where it is coming from, something like this maybe. Just a very mild indication, more than that. Might have to be a bit more saturated perhaps. Is that sufficient? Just a little bit of information on the side. And that's maybe all that I'll do. I don't particularly need to show a little bit, a bit too much on that, just a little bit of that gradient on the canvas. And sort of indicate to myself where the light's going. Okay, so next stage we do is we block things out. So we start with that. Well, there isn't too much that's heavily distinct on this, so let's just draw the things that are distinct, right? Because the rest of it's going to go into Lost Edge. Maybe a good idea, good thing to do over here in this particular drawing is to really just shift up the actual reference and make it much more clear for us to see, which is where level shifting and a bunch of things could uh, easily be something we could do. But the thing is, this is a person, right? And we've drawn enough people. So we should roughly be able to kind of get exactly where these proportions go because we know what people look like and we should be able to generate things from there. So I'm going to simplify his head into a large square like this and I'm going to get this particular angle. I'm going to get that from the reference. That angle right there is this angle right over here. I'm going to figure out exactly where his head kind of relies or head kind of resides on his, uh, on his particular square. So this little horizontal line. I have true horizontal from this top of the canvas and this is not exactly horizontal so I slightly skew it. Up top over here, that top is true horizontal, so I can get a true horizontal up here. And then again, get this little gesture line coming outward, and we can just form everything up. And we have a basic idea of what a turban might look like. We don't entirely know what it is exactly like, but again, this vague notion of what it might be like is exactly what we're trying to get at this stage. A negative shape, I can get pull this down over here. I draw a plumb line, and I figure out that this particular edge of the color. It's slightly outside the plumb line over here. So if I draw a plumb line down here, for example, I'll draw it out physically. That means that this collar over here needs to be slightly outward of that. Also, this angle might be a bit too steep. Slightly outward would be right over here. I can get exactly where the edge of that little collar is. Bring it down. Maybe I'll draw a gesture from out here. Get one fold, get two fold. Bring it down. The basic, basic construction. Same thing over here. Get a gesture from the side of the head. I can bring it down like that where the shoulder is. So I can extend the rest of his body. Ultimately, I think it's a bit smaller. Make it a bit more in proportion with the reference. I think I might have saw it, but I didn't pay much much mind to it since I was trying to do something. But yeah, it's not a not something that's going to be way too, way too important uh, for the majority of people. But again, it makes streaming a bit more accessible, which is always a fun thing, right? I think people should have access to more ways of, uh, of putting themselves out there. Because that means more people will, which means it will make it much better. Because competition is just a good thing. Everybody likes. Well, not everybody likes competition. If you're a competitor, maybe you don't. But uh, for the consumer, that just means that more people streaming means more people, you know, more chance of good people getting to be on the platform. Always support. But still, I wish Twitch had like more of a version towards the rule set or whatever. That's what I was kind of hoping from, from, from the Mixer debacle, but let's see. Maybe if another major streamer goes over the Mixer side, everything will be okay. Maybe uh, Dr. Disrespect or somebody is going to make the little change. Eye-opening. Bring this towards the side. Look at this overall gesture of the hand, just one nice solid stroke. I'll complete the shape right there, a bit of a negative shape. Look at that. This hand is really close to whatever source this is. So I might consider painting it. I'm not entirely certain yet, but we might consider doing it. I'll draw a general gesture for the hand real quick. I know where the forearm goes, right over there. The carpals, meta metacarpals right there. Throw this in there. Carpus and metacarpus. Now this angle is a bit too droopy, but I don't particularly care. It's not going to make or break my drawing, so I'll just leave that in there. A little bit of a bump right there. Get this general gesture coming from the top of the wrist. Coming down here. And then 
My friend Madi Senpai want to get into streaming art, but I don't know how I can encourage them. Well, I can't really force somebody to stream if they uh, if they don't want to stream. But uh, I, I highly suggest people do it. You know, it's a great way of. of I mean, it, it does a bunch of things. I mean, it keeps you accountable to your work. You're checking whether it's something that you even want to do because streaming as a whole is a lot of fun for me. I really enjoy what I do on on Twitch, and I'm glad the people themselves. Uh, like coming to see me. I mean, the popularity thing is, is one thing. I mean, you can't be incredibly successful with everything that you do. That should never be the point, I feel. If you're gonna stream on Twitch, make sure it's something that you're doing something that you already want to do. People like it. Hang around, build a community, it might be really cool. So I do suggest everybody try and do it. I did the bird one, but I have to go now. But I'll try to do this in my own time. It looks really interesting to paint. It is definitely interesting, and thanks so much for painting along. Hopefully you've put it on the Discord, I'd, I'd love to see it. So definitely do submit if you haven't already. I'd really like to check that out. I'm gonna map out some of the uh, shapes on the face real quick. 5 minutes 35 into the drawing. Thanks for drawing with us. I do appreciate you. But yeah, definitely try out streaming. Like, don't put too much like work into it, is what I always say. Just try it out for what it is and see whether or not it's uh, you like doing. Do you like the idea of constantly trying to put yourself out there in, a, in any sort of manner? Because I don't ever say that you should stream with the idea of like being entertaining or whatever. Stream doing what you like and then see if it's something that you really mind. Is it getting in the way? Do you enjoy what you're doing? If you do, anyway, see where it gets you. But yeah, if anybody in here kind of wants to stream, I really recommend like don't put too much ceremony into it, in the sense that don't say, okay, I need OBS, I need to have a, a Discord set up, I need to have all these stream commands and all this stuff. But sure, you can get all those in time, but the first thing you should do is just, just get out there and just start streaming. Get used to the idea of putting yourself out there. It's going to be far, far more effective than trying to make everything look more perfect. Bonnie, are you still here? What happened to stream today? Out in here, really, really quick blocking. <laughs> Everybody with a bag emote. See, Bonish, you shower her with your bags. What's up, Bonnie? How's it going? There's little marks in here, but I think I don't think I need all that much more than that. I might increase the size of the face ever so slightly, but I think I'm kind of getting what I need to from this particular drawing. Again, just a very, very basal evaluation of the overall proportions. Let me make some slight little corrections here. Overall sizing, and I think I should be ready to proceed. Uh, I might slightly indicate the separation of light and dark on this little hand, or on this arm, right? It's one straight lines. Even though everything over here is really, really crazy jagged, I don't want to indicate that right now, because I just want to get that plane of the hand sorted and out of the way. Get that out of the way like this. A bit? Cool. I refuse to use the bag emotes until I know for sure what is in it. What's in the bag? The box. Something in the in the bag. The bag is its own reward in her glow, alright? One cannot say truly what the bag is, what it's for, or when it came here, but what we do know is that it is a bag. That's what's most important. Yeah, you don't even know. <laughs> what do you mean? I am the progenitor of the bag. The bag was birthed from my intellectual loins, alright? If anybody knows what it is for, boy, Indiana Broad. Okay, well, everything is nice and blocked out right now, which is good. You're blocked out. I'm gonna slightly adjust the overall rotation. Health leader is James Plan B. Yeah, I mean. I'm fairly persuasive. Hello, this is a very cool reference. I know, right? Isn't it great? It is kind of cool. So we just finished our block in, in about eight minutes. Let's start slapping on some paint on this big boy, shall we? Okay, so we'll keep this really basic, guys. Really, really basic stuff. We'll slap some green on here. We'll think about local color. And I'll slightly think about the local color in the context of the environment. So I'll warm up these greens. That's a warm green. What is a warm green? That's a green that goes towards the, those yellows here. So I'll apply, I'll slap on some local color. I don't want to be too specific with my strokes here, but I'll slap it on, right? I'll slap it to base. 
And over here, same thing. That's probably a desaturated of some sort. But let's say it's a desaturated yellow because, again, it's in a warmer context. One thing that's really important to note about natural, not particularly natural sources, but fire, especially like fire sources, is that fire is a really shitty source of light compared to like light bulbs, for example. I mean, it, I, I suppose it does depend on what exactly you burn. But for the most part, if you ever take pictures in like a campfire or a camping trip and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't see shit. That's because the sources are really, usually really terrible. So it's important to kind of note that. So when you're drawing something with fire, I mean, as an artist, you can do whatever you want, right? You can always make the fire more effective than it is. But in truth, I mean, fire is not an effective source whatsoever for the majority of things that people burn. So I'm going to keep that in mind when drawing something realistic. But like, why on earth can I not see? Why is there a lost shadow back there? Why can't I see any of the background? That's because fire is a shitty source. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, fire. I didn't mean it. So again, just locally, locally just putting these values in here. Again, for the values on the side, I don't have to particularly care too much about them. I will warm it up eventually. Maybe we'll just warm it up right now, shall we? Let's just let's just warm that up real quick. So I have a value right there. Hit it with a bunch of uh, bunch of dark warm red. We can just use that value and block it out. Being from the Orient, Edward said would would have something to say about that. What is your opinion on about Orientalism as an art subject? Orientalism, as in being Oriental, as in opulence, as in you know being affluent, that kind of thing, like drawing royalty and all that stuff. Otherwise, you're gonna have to define it for me because I'm not familiar with the term. Throw some red in here. Wow, what a question! <laughs> So you know you have a good question, right, Glow? When you have to ask questions about the question to actually figure it out. Dark reds in here. To be fair, this doesn't seem all that crazy, right? It doesn't seem all that crazy. Let's just slightly up this. Not to a gray, but with a slightly, slightly red yellow. I actually want to see things over there. I recognize these colors are a bit too dead right now. But it's fine, these are just base colors, just to separate things out in my own mind. And again, at this point, simplification is key, simplification is master, so don't ever be afraid to be nice and simple at this particular stage. Don't use all that many values, just get your best impression of the piece, at least in terms of the local color out of the way. I'm, I'm just using two values for every kind of base value or base color. So this is one value, this is another value, this is one value, this is another value, this is one value, this is another value. Keeping things nice and nice and controllable. Because these are my majority shapes. Let's get something with the face, shall we? So we'll keep it nice and red. Bunch of subsurfacing. So subsurface in here. Nice and red. We'll darken that up. We'll saturate that up a little bit. How about right there? Are you happy with that? I'm kind of happy with that. This really matter to be honest like with the amount of that i've painted i noticed that as long as i'm roughly where i want to be in terms of the face it's gonna work out work out no matter what i do because again you're not out to get every single thing exactly when you're painting you want to get the semblance you want to get as close as you can get but at the same point same time don't do that to a fault don't just wait till the end of time till you get exactly the correct value because most of the time you're going to go over things more than once that's important to note because if you go over things more than once then don't stress and stress and stress on a layer that's never ever gonna be visible to the viewer it's no point he used midtones to blacken then the hearts and shadows uh it really depends on majority uh glow it depends on what i see majority like for example if something is majority dark or whatever i'll just put the dark in to begin with but frankly it, it, especially digital speak when talking about digital it doesn't really matter so you can go any way you want so whatever your preference is. So definitely I, at the beginning I will paint just majority, right? And if I can't decide on what majority is, for example in this case I'm like, ah, I'm not quite sure because I want things to be visible, then I'll just start with the mid-tone. But indeed not always. If I can analyze the majority then I'll use a the majority. But in this case I could, base, I could barely even see, like if I painted the darkness first it would be a dark on a dark. Like if I painted this green, like I can, I can barely see it on my monitor. 
So it's harder for me to kind of get that accurately placed. So I painted the mid-tone first, and then I painted that darken. So I can actually see what I was doing. It's kind of ideas. So you kind of adapt to whatever you need. Nice, quick, and basic. Keep it right there. Quick test my values. There we go. Looking nice and juicy already. Okay, so now that we are at this stage, I can, I can start layering on some information. The first thing that I want to get in any of these drawings is this really clear depiction of the separation of light and dark, right? Because that's like what everybody really wants to get on a painting. Especially painting in value, right? So let's just first get to that stage. So it's going to be a very careful selection of value. Because again, some of these little materials over here are not going to be extremely, extremely reflective, which means that that separation of light and dark is not going to take all that much to kind of establish. Also, remember at this point is that we have to consider the temperature of a light source because the closer we get to the light source or the more visible that particular light source is from these planes, the more it's going to jump into that yellow. So this little green over here should be more yellow than this green over here. It should be more yellow than this green over there. That's the idea. Same thing with this one. This needs to be more yellow and brighter. You see, now suddenly it's starting to make a bit of sense, right? Even if I don't see this very clearly in my reference, it's going to be there in my painting because this is a strong amount of visual clarity for the image. So in general, at first you average out the big colors. Exactly, because we don't want to be doing work when we don't need to be doing work, right? For example, if you see an area that's primarily white, would you start there with the black because you always start there with the black? Well, no, because you want your process to be a bit more adaptable than that. This kind of thing. And it makes sense to do so, right? Most Muslim cultures, a good chunk of the Orient uh, prohibit representational art because of religious reasons. So in the 18th century, and some Western painters created the imagery of the Orient from an outside perspective. Uh, well, I don't know anything about that uh, around me, so I don't really have a, an opinion, I guess. No, at least not an educated one. Let me quickly go through it for you. See if I am familiar with the subject in terms of other words and notations. Paintings depicting the Middle East. No, I don't think I do have an opinion. I've never once encountered this. I, I never once thought about paintings of the Middle East or Orientism as a separate portion. I think art is art, right? Why make a distinction? What's the timer running for that? Hopefully it wasn't. Okay. Okay, at this point, I just want to get enough information in here and then get rid of my lines ASAP. Let's just start strengthening out some of these separations, right? Because I want them to run the read as strongly as they do. So, I'll firstly, get this dark. And again, when you get that dark, it's like, oh, goodness, we have this dark right now. So, you jump. You jump and you place that dark wherever you can, right? You jump around the entire canvas and you place that dark because you have to replace some of the initial values that you chose. Because, again, we can't ever think that the things that we chose initially are correct. Always have to be flexible with the things that we do on our canvas. Again, so right now the lines are almost becoming limiting, right? So when they do become limiting in a certain area, I stop it. What's an outside perspective? That generally means that it's somebody that isn't really involved. For example, look at the war in like Afghanistan or whatever. Like for us people in Europe, for example, we don't really, it's an outside perspective because we're not involved in it. We don't have too much of an emotional attachment or involvement into it. So that would be an outside perspective for that. That kind of idea. it slightly about this little light right there and again i feel like all of these lights over here need to be strengthened that's perfectly fine we can strengthen them but again when i strengthen them since these are occlusions or dark areas on the canvas i can easily just push this towards more of a dark local color green at an actual perspective no 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 not perspective in the drawing i don't think again all these goes into that nice little dark re dark green region that is indeed a local color. And we can lose this edge right now, let's say. Let's just lose this edge completely. So it'll be easier to do this without the lines, but at this point, I'm just going to get rid of it. So this is what I just did. If you guys... Just got rid of the edge completely. It looked like this before. Got rid of it. Because we don't really need it. If 
well in your lights in your rights to, uh, to do that okay again more stuff over here uh, let me just get rid of the lines entirely because I don't need them anymore because I just needed some specifics on the face and now I'm done with that so I can get, get rid of it because again it's obstructing a lot of stuff on the on the actual painting so I want to be a little bit worried about that so again I have the separation I'm going to just throw in, throw in some orange and some darker values where I think they need to go roughly speaking again over here this light value these light values need to go towards that yellow they need to be pushed in that direction so again I might strengthen them up strengthen them up and push them more towards that yellow this because again the light surge itself is a warm so it makes sense that the areas within the lights are going to go more towards a warm always good to think about the light sources on your cameras on anything that you paint really allow you to arrive at your colors much more quickly much more accurately just like that and of course we make some mild proportional corrections just like this A little bit of hints, hints of uh, texture there. Not quite sure how deep I'm going to get into the texture of this piece, but a little bit of a hint right there is not completely out of the way. And this light definitely needs some improvements, right? We need to really, really up the information over here because again, it's not just desaturated, but it's a desaturated light value. So it's going to take on a lot of that characteristic of my light source. So I push that more towards the yellow. Again, if you're wondering why I'm talking about saturation, why I'm talking about light source, it all comes back to our fundamental idea of interaction of color or interaction of light on surface and that says that if a plane is facing towards my light source the more it's facing my light source the more it's going to take on that characteristic of the light source itself which means it's going to be brighter and it's going to be more saturated in the direction of the color temperature of my light source aka it's going to be colored like my light source is colored right so if you are facing a yellow light source the planes of your face that are hit by that yellow light source are going to be the most yellow with respect to everything else in your body but this is not to talk about the local color or whatever whatever but it's to talk about strictly that light source this kind of idea really that over overarching theme of all these paintings let's slightly warm this up because i want a warmer value here this with a bit more red. Using a combination of an airbrush and a burn brush right there. Just burning in some warmer colors. Right now, if we get this texture, I can use this brush ever so slightly. I'm only going to use a texture towards the edges here, by the way, because I haven't really determined exactly where these folds are supposed to go. Just a little bit of texture detail right there, a little bit of information. Let me just jump around and apply the same bright, bright value to the areas that really need it, right? Because some of these planes you see are directly, they're so, so bright, and that's because they're facing directly at my light source, or their edges, which create that little bit of a Fresnel effect. Google the Fresnel effect if you're interested. A little effect. Just some indications of lines to tell me where the folds are supposed to go later on. Will I ever get to that stage in this painting? Maybe, maybe not, but you know, just setting up for the future in case it's, it's at all necessary. And of course, it's nice, lovely light right there. Nice, lovely light right here. I think that's nice and simple and controlled. Again, very clear, clear indications. What is in light, what is in shadow? Should be very clear on every drawing. That's in shadow right there. That's in light right here. That amount of visual clarity always looks good just from a design perspective right light on dark on light on dark it just looks good in general that's part of our graphic read the picture that we draw no problem glow i'll see you in a bit same thing goes right here right same dark value okay this goes more into the red Maybe a bit more brighter than we just had it. These large areas of dark, let's just get that out of the way really quickly. Large, large, expressive areas of dark that I think are worth capturing. So I'll make some simplifications as I paint, and that's perfectly fine to do. And simplification is important whenever you're drawing anything. 
always easier to draw in the details than it is to fix an overall issue that's been missed. So in terms of prioritization while drawing, get that overall information first and then get the little details later on. For instance, if I drew in this little highlight first, that would be fine, but what about the, the light that's surrounding it? That's more important technically for the overall read, right? Even though this highlight looks really nice, most important thing for the read is that light area, not just the little highlight. Four minutes into the painting. There's some subtlety in here that you can start to capture here. I'll sample a lighter value. It really depends on how much of a range we want to put in our painting, right? Because paintings do have a range to them. And you want to think about exactly what that means or exactly how that imp impacts your little structure in your painting when you're kind of selecting your values for it. Because maybe I don't want to show as much range in this darkness. Maybe I want to keep it really simple. And that's something you can do, right? Because you can choose to make the painting about the lights or about the shadow. And in fact, that is something that's quite encouraged by a lot of people that design the light and shadow because you want to have things that are clearly in the light and clearly in the shadow. And that amount of clarity is oftentimes strengthened by the idea of saying, okay, well, I'm only going to keep on my painting, I'm going to reserve like these many values for my shadows, let's say. So I have one shadow value over here, and maybe I have a slightly lighter value. It's going to show a bit of range. Maybe I have one more slightly lighter value like this, and with this value, I kind of depict everything inside. And that's it, because I can't use more than that, that many values, because if I have to use more than that many values, it's going to kind of muddy up my entire painting, it's going to complicate too many things, and it's going to kind of somewhat affect my structure, so... It's a thing to think about. It really is a genuine, like, important thing to consider when doing any painting, is that how, much, how many values do I actually want to put in this painting? Because of course, with the introduction of edges, there's going to be so many subtle values, but in terms of those clear majority values, you shouldn't be putting in like arbitrary amounts of those because you should be having an intense amount of control over those majority values. Because the more amount of those large amounts of values you put on there, the more difficult it becomes for the viewer to determine exactly what's in light and what's in shadow. And if we are unable to do that, then the entire point of the painting starts to fail. Which is why when selecting values for a painting, oftentimes we do this, right? We say, I'm going to have a light value like this and a second light and a third light and then you say okay i'm gonna have a shadow value and then the shadow value is way darker than this a way darker value a way darker value so there's more values that means there's more values between these two and if there are more values between those two that means the overall separation of light and dark gets killed in your image it means that your image no longer reads as strongly as it should So we can't put an indefinite amount of value in any piece. Very much does affect our read. Okay, I'll just continue with this. I'm happy enough with how this is progressing. I mean, the I'm getting that little foldy effect up there with a the minimal amount of strokes, and I'm perfectly happy with leaving it right there. I want to slightly indicate this right here, which is that little gilding on the side of his, his cloth. Oh, that little gilding looks awesome. Kind of thing. I Probably just the edge of the clothing, but the edge being so small, it's becoming a lot more reflective, which means it takes on more of the characteristic of my light source. It means it heads more towards a warm in comparison to everything else. So everything should be justifiable. At least we must try and justify it. The nice distinct stuff. Again, make sure that those shadows are corresponding together. Those shadows need to have the same value, otherwise kill the read. So it's actually a fairly important thing why you must work very basically at the very beginning, because if your shadows themselves don't have that amount of coordination that they need, it can affect the overall read, because some shadows in some areas can be different from shadows in other areas. That's another strong thing to consider. Because if you consider this as a camera, the camera is going to be exposed for a certain value in the deep, deep shadows. And if those values in those 
expected deep areas aren't the same, then gonna kill your read. So if there's a dark shot over here, that darkness must be the same as the valley over here because they're similar folds, therefore the value must be similar. Might seem obvious, but very easy to get that wrong, especially when simplifying. Let me pause my timer. My arm is on fire. That back down and set at a very strange angle. Okay, I think we're good. 59 minutes in. Let's go into that face. Do a little bit of rendering right there. I think we can get it locked on. I don't really justify strokes here. Might be a fun little exercise. So I need some darkness for the eye right there. So we need to put one nice long stroke right there for the eye. Get ready to put that in there. Okay, so we need to get a bit of a stroke right there for that side of the cheek right there. So we're going to put one little stroke right there. Take the side of the cheek. I am missing that certain amount of darkness back here, right? So let's sample this darkness over here. We could even take the darkness from over here, from the side of the face. So we'll bring that up in a manner that's consistent, right there. So one, two, and three strokes, right there. we we'll get rid of this little light value right there as well. We need that. Uh, back here. Of course, knowing the way that faces are positioned, knowing the planes of the face, we can Probably do some simplification over here. So there's a light value up there. Not gonna be nearly as light as the cheek. It's gonna be somewhat light, so we'll do a darker value. I wanna just place a slightly light value right here near the top. Same thing goes for right over here. And this little light here can go directly in the middle. I probably wanna warm up this light source a little bit. Or indeed, alternatively, I can pick a slightly darker light value. Push that towards the red and get a similar effect. A lot of options to do. I'll pick this value as my second value in the lights. Now I'm going to shape the entire face based on these values. Simple, simple application. Uh, this right side of the nose does not necessarily need to be drawn uh, with a high amount of like information. So I'll really consider not putting it in unless I really need to. Because we have that choice, right? We can choose to put certain things in if we think they're necessary. For right now, I don't particularly think that that side of the nose is necessary. We'll see if it is, right? So we'll just continue painting and we'll see if it is necessary. Because perhaps it's not. So I, I need a value for the right side, I'm sorry, the left side of that eye right there. That does go into shadow. Take that little dark color right there. Okay. And there's going to be a form shadow over here. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. How's it going, Malarkey? Thanks for the follow. That form shadow right over here, that's right above the zygomatic bone right there. But this whole, this cavity right there is the orbit. There's a little bit of that darkness right above the zygomatic because everything is kind of indented, it's, it's inside. So if you study your Asaro heads, you'll notice that this entire area indeed turns around, right? Because this is where the face starts to turn, this whole area. And the more sunken in the eye is, the more you're going to get more of those nice little formative shapes inside the eye. So we'll add a little bit of value right there. So now we have that little step, right? And then the audio clip of followers? Yeah, it's that. So what we're searching for is this little idea, right? The step. So this can be done so many ways, right? What we just arrived at, we can do so many ways. We can just do that observationally. We can do that observationally. We can just say, okay, I observe. What do I observe? I observe this little step. One step, two step, three step. This little Minecraft staircase, right? We can see this quite, quite clearly. And that's a very simple way of observing that. Alternatively, we can ask ourselves, what do I know about the face? And then say, okay, well, I know this about the face. I know that the zygomatic bone goes over there. I know the orbit is over here. I know the structure of the eyeball. I know how the eye actually gets the light and I can justify it that, that sort of way. So, so many ways of doing this. What are the benefits of it? Well, one is observational and the other one is by construction. And construction helps us if we're trying to draw this from imagination, right? If you want to draw the same face from imagination, if you want to draw any face, Doing this kind of thing really helps us out because we're able to say objectively, okay, this is why it's happening. And when you try to justify light directions on your on your on your um, canvas later on, you can say, okay, well, this is why it's happening. 
and be able to be accurate and convincing about it. How's it going, Rage? It's good to see you. Things are going fine on my end. It's going to be done. Bring it down here. Bring a darkness over here for that nostril. Easy enough. Of course, I'm going to have to add a little bit of that light right here to indicate the maw. What is it called? Orbusculus oris. That muscle around here. Over here, that's a masseter. This kind of thing is... It, it might be orbusculus oris. I'm not quite sure exactly what it's called. But anyway, that needs to be indicated some, somewhat strongly. So we'll indicate it, a little bit of that right there. And I can just simplify that. I don't have to complicate it. But easy enough. Get that little bit of a uh, darkness over here underneath the mouth. That's the skin that flaps over the maxilla, which is a bone. Maxilla is that bone right above your teeth, part of your upper skull. I mean, it's part, part of your skull, it's an upper skull, it's just part of the, this side of the skull, and this down here is the mandible. Okay, so the darkness over here itself, so it's just very dark, very plain, so we need to add a little bit of light to it, and the light needs to go more towards the warm. Because, again, the light source in this particular case is warm. And, again, our idea of interaction of light and surface tells us that if, indeed, we're going to put a light onto a surface, it must follow that color temperature of the light source. So if you put a yellow light on anything, whenever you're considering the light source or the light regions of that thing, you have to think about, okay, this is a yellow light. So the regions within the light source have to go more towards that yellow. Right, because that's our fundamental right there. That's our fundamental understanding of light and surface. Always, always true. That's good. Good oh, thing. Fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thank you for the follow, Nadeski. Again, same thing over here. Also, remember that reuse, man. Reuse is so important. So, when I put that dark well over here, I'm gonna. I have so many reasons I can put that in there. So this dark is available here, available here, available here, available here. So many reasons that we can just simply. Apply that, that same, same idea again and again and again. And that's powerful. That's so powerful doing it that way. Because not only is that keeping everything in our piece coordinated, but that's keeping uh, things very simple for us to understand. Because it's easy to just sample again and again and again, right? That's a simple thing to do. And that's affording us a certain amount of luxury when it comes to the painting. Because not only are things automatically co uh, coordinating with each other, but they're harmonizing with each other. That's powerful. Because we don't want things to be super distinct. Also, I will use this light value on this side to kind of mark out the face. Now, I'm somewhat a little bit trepidatious over here because I don't know exactly the way the face is going to turn around here. But I know roughly, based on my own knowledge about faces, I know roughly where it's going to go. So, I'll somewhat content myself with this particular shape over here. If you're wondering how I got this value, I simply went down here. I picked this value over here and I brought it up here because they look similar enough. And that's something you have to do on your own painting. So, if you think, oh my goodness, I can't pick every single value on this piece, it's way too much. I can't, I can't just choose by myself. Well, you don't have to. You could really like choose some values and then it's just picking off your own piece, right? Because over here, when I've chose this value, I'm saying to myself, this is the value, not right now, because I have to correct this value later on, but this is currently the value that says this is the plane of this particular green cloth that is facing towards my light source. So it goes both light and value and it goes high in saturation that is yellow saturation. Can you explain the warm lights, cold shadows, and vice versa to a dummy? Yeah, of course we can do that. Just give me one second. How about we start doing that at 40 minutes into this piece? We'll go into that in detail. Okay, so you notice I put this cast shadow in here at the very beginning. Also, it's an interesting topic. We can go into it. So I'll preface that while I'm painting right now. But the preface to warm shadows, cool lights is that people want you to have good amounts of color variance in your painting. Why is that? Well, the reason is because color variance is an interesting thing to see on a painting. If everything is homogeneously colored, which means everything is uniformly warm or uniformly cool, that kind of makes your painting a little bit more boring because it's almost like saying everything is uniformly light or uniformly dark. Like we know, all of us know that, okay, well, if you want to make something look good, well, it needs to have these high amounts of dark and high amounts of light and it needs to have some amount of clarity. And we, we are somewhat familiar with this idea. And it's, it's true because we do need these ideas. But in the notion of color, while well, it becomes so much more important for us to also think about a similar concept, but not in terms of value, but in terms of temperature. So what does temperature mean in the context of color? Temperature refers to this warmness or coolness of certain colors on the color wheel. Now, things aren't, now this is a very, very important thing, arguably one of the most important in the subject. You have to understand that things aren't objectively warm and cool. 
right? Warm and cool are relative terms. Now it really depends. I often, oftentimes hesitate giving this, this piece of advice to people that are absolute beginners, but we'll just we'll just be thorough with this particular idea because I think it's it's fairly graspable by anybody. So warmness and coolness is relative. I'll get back to it about why that is. But it, right now we'll just consider that it is. So some colors are warmer than others, and some colors are cooler than others, and we want a good amount of contrast between those warmness and coolness on our canvas for us to kind of end up in an effective, you know, very, very appealing in terms of visual piece. So that's our idea. So in that regard, it's up to us to try to find areas that we can place this warmness and coolness on our canvas and thereby take advantage of the fact that they look really cool together, they look really nice when you have that coordination, when you have that, that contrast in colors. Now the question becomes, where do I put my warms and where do I put my cools? And now this little question can get traced back all the way to what's the actual origin of color on pieces? Where does color come from? So again, we can list this out. I'll list it out right now if you'd like. Or anything. So it comes from this. Let me just make a new layer for you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about color in general, right? Origin of color. Now, where does color come from? Number one, local color. That is color of the object. Number two is color of the light source. AKA, this is what we call color temperature. And number three is your ambient and diffuse light. So this is all that is, by the way. This is the origin of color. You don't have to think too much about anything else. Unless it's a fringe case. Okay? So what is... Let's add all these ideas together. And we'll use a ball to do that, right? So I'll draw a sphere. I'll first draw the sphere in value. Right? So I'll start with the gray sphere. I'll start with the dark. So it has a dark and it has a light. We all know this. Sphere. Easy enough. So... In value, the easy thing about this, I can even go further than this and add more information. I can add a core shadow right there. All right, that's a core shadow. I can add an area of light that's a bit more clear. I'll go that high, maybe this high. And I can add a highlight. All right, and that's basically everything in a sphere. Maybe I can add a little bit of a secondary, uh, maybe a secondary light right here complete little diagram of all the lights possible. It's a really, really quick sphere rendering. So this is in value, and I'm assuming you can do this, because if we can't do this, then color is secondary. That's why most people say, do a painting in value first and then do it in color, because when it comes down to, and this is coming from your boy Nathan Fox, Nathan Fox is a genius when it comes to color. I highly recommend you search any of his information up. He has a great, great schoolism course that I take, called Design with Color and Light. This guy is a genius. Anyway. So when it comes to the origin of color for painters, what do you think about for color in painting? Think about these two things. Number one is to think about the value, which is this, what we just showed. And number two is to think about the temperature. Now this is your question. Because when you think about the temperature, we're thinking about this. Thinking about the warms versus the cools. Okay, and now we come to the actual part of color. So we have to get the values first and foremost. So we have this little sphere in value. How do we take this into color? So I'm going to redraw this sphere. I'm going to redraw it on another layer, make things nice and clear. And we'll show you the sphere in color. So again, we start with here, the local color. We don't have to start here, but just since I listed everything out here, we'll list them out in order, we'll paint them in order as well. So we can say that this sphere is red, it's green, it's whatever. So a local color is things that are intrinsically colored a certain way. If you want to think about this in terms of physics, is that certain objects, they absorb certain wavelengths of light and they will radiate certain wavelengths of light. And the, the wavelength that they radiate is the one they're colored with. So a red ball absorbs all wavelengths except for the wavelength of red, which is why it's red. But we don't have to go that specific. We can just think about it simply as some things are red, some things are green, skin is this color, the sky is that color. You know, in certain circumstances, this is all true. So let's say it's a red ball, okay? So we start with this ball being locally red. Like that that's a nice little mid-tone value and now we must apply the concept of light to this red ball all right i'm not talking about warm and cool light or whatever i'm just saying 
This is a, a light source which has no color whatsoever. It's a nice white light source. What happens? It's a nice white light source and it's, there's no secondary light. It's in vacuum, basically. So what happens then? Then obviously, because of the value, we have the value structuring right here, right? So I know what happens when this gets hit by light. This goes lighter, that goes darker, given the light is coming from this particular direction, right? So it goes lighter. Remember, it's a white, white light. So it goes whiter. Not only does it go lighter, it goes more desaturated. So explain one more thing and then that's all the information that we need to really gather for answering questions over here. One last major thing here. So this will go lighter like that. Okay? And then this will go just darker. Game stream is more important, knowledge is power. How's it going to glow? Hopefully your phone call went good. This is the idea, right? So it just goes darker. And now, this is the most important piece of information, right? The most important piece of information. All this discussion beyond the fundamentals. And it is this. So you have to remember that when it comes to any interaction of light and surface, you have this mantra you have to remember. The mantra goes like this. When light, when light is incident on a, in a surface, planes, aka the the surface direction so i hope you know what a plane is basically this over here if i just cut out a little portion over here that's pointing this way this is pointing that way that is pointing this way that's a plane a plane is an oriented surface right the planes that are directly or that that point directly to my light source they get saturated in the direction of the light source this is getting a bit complicated i know and it gets lighter so this one we know actually we know this one right because over here we know that from value we're saying that if the light is coming from this way these planes get lighter we know this much from value what about in terms of color well we know this if it gets lighter that means that the source is having more of an effect on the surface which means whatever color that light source is is going to have more effect on those lighter regions so basically the lighter something gets the more it gets affected by the color temperature of the light source. And that's the key when it comes to trying to determine or trying to strongly, strongly decipher color on this. Now using this information, using this information, then we're gonna solve the warm versus cool problem because we need to know this. We need to know how it interacts first before we do anything else. So if I was to redraw this sphere over here, right? Get rid of this real quick. I, well, I guess I can't. I was to draw one more sphere over here, right? I'll draw another sphere. In this case, we'll say it's red, okay? We'll say it's red. The same local color red over here. I'm going to apply, let's say it's a deep red like this. I'm going to apply a blue light on top of this. Okay, a blue light. What happens then? So again, we know about light and shadow, right? So again, I'll just set an airbrush over here. So I know the shadow is going to be in dark because, of course, the light's not going to affect the shadows. So I know the shadow is going to go nice and dark, so the shadow goes dark like that. And what happens to the light side of it? Remember, the planes that point directly to the light source become more saturated or more lighter in the direction of my light source. So if this is a blue light, I'll make this even more evidently clear to you. I can draw in a small light source right here so you know what to expect. I'll draw a small blue light source here. What happens then? So that blue light source is going to shine light on this, which means that this color, this red, is going to go more in the direction of this blue. Now you need to know color theory for this, oh, right? Fuck. I can't believe you've done this. You need to have a good solid understanding of color theory, otherwise it's going to be a bit more problematic because what does that mean? So for a red to go more in the direction of my, of that blue light, what needs to happen is that the red needs to desaturate, right? Because I'll show you this all via my, my color selector right here. But you see this? So for red to reach blue all the way here, you can either transition all the way through these colors to get all the way to the blue, or what could happen is this. Now, this is another really important thing. If you don't know, this is a really cool thing. But I call this the gray bridge. You can call it whatever you want. But when I go from this red to a blue, I have a really simple path here. And that path isn't this path. It's not necessarily this path. 
to get to a blue? I have an alternative, right? I have a desaturated part. I'll desaturate, I'll desaturate, and I'll desaturate. I'm going to add a gray right now. And then I can resaturate into a blue. So there's a gray bridge. And oftentimes when it comes to complementary colors, or colors that are somewhat complementary to each other, this gray is going to be a lot quicker to arrive at than to arrive at a neighboring color like a purple. So when a blue light source is incident towards my red surface, it's going to gray it out a little bit. So we start right there. You see, that's my that's my local color right there. So it's a light source. So again, think about the value. So this value tells us that it goes lighter, right? It needs to go lighter. So it goes lighter, but it also goes more gray, right? It also goes more towards the gray because it's a blue light source and that's interaction of light and surface. So again, look at that preamble right there. Light incident on the surface means that the planes that point directly or you know are pointing more towards my light source get more of that light and more of that saturation. So therefore, this is going to get a bit of that blue on there. This is not even blue. You see, that's desaturating this. And I'll desaturate more. So the more it's pointing towards my light source, the more it's going to go towards that blue. AKA more it's going to get desaturated. And finally, what happens is that it's going to go right over here, maybe, right? It's going to get even lighter. It's going to go right here. Does that look like it makes sense? Does that look like it's a bit of a blue source? And again, the more it goes closer, the more it's going to go blue. So we see some very common things happening over here, right? What's happening, really? So we have a few things we can observe from this little description, right? The first thing we can observe is that as the light goes towards the shadow, the effect, the, basically the saturation of the local color of the particular object, it goes from the color of the light source, so CT, that's color temperature of the light source, to the local color. It has a slight transition, you see there? It goes from being, goes from almost being blue, so it goes from blue right there, to being desaturated purple, to being desaturated red, more red, more red, more red, more red. Two things, remember, it goes from lighter to darker, it goes from the color temperature of my light source, to the local color, right? And that's it. If you know this, you can basically paint anything effectively and with a strong sense of color. Because this is really what like, matters, generally speaking, when it comes to any drawing. So I know this is a little bit boring because it's just a bunch of spheres. Then let me just show you something that I've done, I've done a while ago in terms of, um, in terms of light and surface. I'll show you this really quickly. And Thanks for the follow, um, guys. Who's that? Lalbert and Marios? Thanks, guys. So I'll show you this in a bit more sensible of an environment, shall I? So we'll go towards one of our older paintings. So this was a painting that I did to test this information, right? Interaction of light and surface. So this is a painting a while ago. So again, this is very, very evident to clear. So I'll explain the same thing. Now remember, again, I'm going to really hone this into your brain here because it's really important. It really changed my life when it comes to when it comes to colors. So light incident surface. Maybe I'll say this a bit simpler, right? Basically, what that means is that if I have a light source in my in my setting, if it's going to have an effect on the things in my setting, the planes, aka the oriented surfaces in my subject, in my drawing, the planes that are facing this directly are both the lightest and also the most saturated. Really, really important. The, the planes that are facing this are the lightest and the most saturated. So you see, if you understand the structure of the of the of the human head, right? And if you don't understand this, if you don't understand structure, please, please study structure. If you're wondering how to study structure for the head, I really encourage you guys to look at things like Asaro heads, for example. It's gonna be really, really important for you to do so. Here's some examples of an Asaro head really quickly. Thank you, Belia. So let me show you this real quickly. So for this particular condition, this is the Asaro that we take. Now this is going to be a pretty important moment, right? Right here. It's spelled A-S-A-R-O, Asaro. Somebody in the mod team can uh, quick that for me. That'd be great. But no, this is going to be really cool, okay? So let's identify. So this light source is forward of the face. What does that mean really? That means that if I have a plane that is facing forward, 
those planes are going to be the lightest and the most saturated. Now, now this is kind of cool because this is standard structure, right? So what are the forward facing planes? That one right there, right? This one is semi forward. This one is forward right here. This one is forward right here. This one over here, right, right there is forward. This is the forward of the eye. That is forward of the eye. That is forward of the eye. That is forward of the skull somewhat, right? Maybe this little turning point. And now look at this. Now this is really cool. So look at the things that are highlighted over here based on what is forward and then check the painting and then see what's currently in the most light and the most saturated. What do we see? Forward, 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 forward. Seem familiar? See that? See the correlation? This is the key right here. That's the key to um, having effective saturated light sources. Because we can't just arbitrarily apply saturation. We have to justify the saturation based on color temperature of the light source and local color. So this is just a, a brief overview of why it works. And there's a whole bunch of like added issues. Like you could ask me what happens if the local color is more saturated than the light source? Well, it becomes, then it goes from being affected by the light source to the local color. Right? So it becomes, you can easily have go from saturation to more saturation. But the idea is we don't speak about saturation in general. We speak about the saturation that's generated from this light source. Okay, then finally, when we understand all of this, then we go finally into the idea of a warm and cool, right? Because we need to understand how light sources interact before we say warm and cool. Okay, so now, why do they say warm and cool on the painting? Well, when it comes to any painting, when it comes to the foundational area of intrigue in a painting, it's important to understand where interest really comes from. So interest in a painting, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion, it comes from the notion of contrast. And now contrast does not necessarily mean contrast in terms of value, because we know these ones, we know these easily. We know we have our dark values over here, we have light values over here, and light against dark, it looks good. But contrast could mean a lot more than just value. We can say contrast in terms of shapes, right? If I draw a bunch of squares like this, draw a bunch of squares, and suddenly in the middle of that, I put a giant triangle. Where do you look? You look here, you look here. You look here. You look right there. Giant triangle. But maybe that's maybe wrong for shape. Maybe like this, that's for shape. It could also be for size, right? Size contrast. This is interestingness in a piece, right? So I draw a bunch of regular circles. I draw one big circle. Where do you look? Right there. Because most interesting. It could be an amount of information, even. Something much more fundamental than that. Information, right? So what happens if I do this? Let's say I put one line here, 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 and I put three lines right here. Where do you look? Right there. So in accordance with this, the so contrast just means difference. So the more different things we have, the more interesting the piece can be. We don't want too much difference, by the way. Uh, this is a little bit of a side note, but if you guys search for this little phrase, this is one of the most important things you want to draw from imagination. The, the idea of unity with diversity, the idea that you need enough of the same but enough of the different, it's a great principle right there, one of the fundamental design principles in all of like visual communication. But again, so in this whole list of things that we can have different, right? Names that, that's called proximity. What's called proximity? Is this contrast? Sure, semantics, right? But in this whole list, we do have such a thing as called color contrast, right? So I can show you this very simply based on a crit that I did recently. This might be even more evident, right? So this is why we search for this in PC. Quickly find that, uh, that crit where it sits. Because we did apply this to this piece over here. Look at this piece right here submitted by... I'm not quite sure who this was. Somebody in the Discord. Uh, but somebody in our community, an artist just like me and you. So look at this piece and tell me if you like it. I like it. It's a good piece. But really important to notice here is that we don't have too much temperature variance. Now when I say temperature, remember, I'm talking about the relative warmness and coolness, right? Some people say temperature, they mean, they mean this, right? They mean things over here. Things generally over here are warmer. Things over here are cooler. Now, cooler, warmer. Remember, I don't say warm, I don't say cool, because things are relative. I can explain this if you'd like me to, but uh, the best thing to do is to Google any source, like Marco Bucci's videos and color is a great thing, but to slightly indicate that, don't think anything as objectively warm and cool. Because, for example, you can think that this, let's say this red 
is a warm color or this orange is a warm color right that's a warm color but then this yellow is even more warmer than that orange and this tends to be cooler than this the same thing that this cool or this this red is a coolish color let's say but this red compared to this blue looks warm right so it's relative it's a bit of a side note that requires more attention but it's fine as you learn more about color it'll make more sense but the thing is look at this piece in general right it has a certain impact because of the value it has a certain impact about the edge but we could improve it because it doesn't have an impact in terms of that balance between warm and cool so i can simply change this balance really quickly but just simply making those midtones more blue let's say so I make those midtones more blue and suddenly how would make the shadows more blue suddenly look at what happens like it adds this whole new dynamic to the piece right so this doesn't upset the shadows any with the piece but you see that overall improvement that happens that's because suddenly we have more of a warm cool balance right and it starts to become more interesting so what is the origin of warm cool in a lot of situations because you need to be able to justify this for it to make any sense of any amount of sense right you need to be able to somewhat justify this so i'll bring you to the last little point that we can talk about right now which is the origin of warm cool in a certain condition which is in the condition of being outside in the middle of the day so where does warm cool happen because let's picture this right let's picture a nice sunny day outside so in that sunny day we have a bright blue sky right like this got a bright blue sky i mean we can just draw this out a bit more specifically right so it goes more white as it moves more down it's kind of idea and we have a sun nice bright sun in here in the middle of the sky so what happens when something is subject to this lighting condition so i'm going to remove the sun for a second because i want this to be a distant light source and i will just generally say that the light source is coming from when the sun is coming from this direction okay from that way that's my light direction let's quickly draw a cube right we'll draw it in perspective we'll draw a quick little ground plane first right there sorry my i was in a weird position let me just adjust that because i can't get straight lines because my, my hand keeps hitting the uh keeps hitting the bottom so i'll draw a quick little ground plane right there easy enough right and I place a square on top of this. So one line, one line right here. Or well, we can just start, start right there, right? Start right there, bring it parallel to my ground plane, bring it to the right. I'll just draw through. So one, two, three, three right there, and then four. And again, parallel to the ground plane, one here, one here, there, and then this intersection point, and then it goes here. Okay, so we have a nice little cube. We'll draw those a little bit in terms of one, twos, and threes. So we Talking at the counters right there, one, two, then three right there, and four right there. Okay, so we have this very, very basic cube, but probably really shittily. You're gonna have, gonna have to excuse me right there. Um, so talk about the interaction of this little light source or this little object in terms of the of the uh, environment, right? So let's say this is red, just for the sake of our explanation, because we've been talking about red for a while now. So we'll just start right there. We'll start right there and say this object over here is locally colored red. Okay, I think that's a fairly easy place to start from. So without any light source whatsoever, we'll say this is colored something like this. That's something like a dullish, a dullish red. That's where I start. So now I introduce my light source. My light source is a lovely, lovely, bright warm, right? So warm means over here. So warm is not that much of a complementary color to red. So red's right over here in a warm. Let's say that the, the sun over here is this color. It's this color over here. So I can just put this ball over here to remind you. Which means that this red is going to go brighter and more towards that color temperature of my light source. It goes more towards that yellow. Right? So this is going to be the value on the top. Not as much, maybe this much. So this is going to be the value on the top. So I can just color everything on top with that brighter, more yellow value. And this is very simple enough, right? Simple enough. So it starts right there. So now what else happens? Now this is the origin of warm and cool in a sunny condition. This is not the only light source in my drawing. Believe it or not, there is a hemisphere. And now we know this technically. 
but we don't think about it in painting all the time especially if you're a beginner so there's a hemisphere of a sky around here right i'll draw the hemisphere really quickly there's a huge hemisphere of the sky so we don't just have this little source of the sun right here we have the sky all around what the sky does is it also projects light everywhere around the top hemisphere it projects blue light all around because it's in a blue condition so what's that gonna do so keep this in mind keep this in mind there's a hemisphere around this it's gonna be important okay so first let me draw the shadow in all right there's not gonna be any bounce line. i'm not gonna bring that up right now in this discussion i'll just bring a shadow in let's say because i want a clear distinction so let's say this is in shadow right there and so we'll say we'll leave this as a current value we'll say it's in half tone now look at what happens oh this is kind of cool so let's say this is in partial light this is in light this is in shadow so because there's a hemisphere of blue around this object, it's going to be blue light filtering from every direction that's facing in this upper hemisphere. What that means is that even though this area is in a shadow and that shadow is just a darker version of the local color, it's going to bring that shadow slightly lighter and slightly cooler. It's going to end up with something like this. So slightly lighter, slightly cooler. We end up with this kind of idea. It cools it up. Do you understand why? It happens because because there's light coming from all around, and there's blue light filtering from the atmosphere into these regions, right? into regions like this. There's light coming from that way. This is a huge hemisphere, and this will not have an effect over here in the area of light because this is already affected by a much stronger light source. So this sun predominates over the sky. But here there's no sun, there's only sky, so sky predominates. And that's why, why they say if you have a warm light, especially in a sunny condition, if you have a warm light, you have a cool shadow. So generally speaking, they say warm versus cool on a pieces because, again, why, do, why is that the case? Because of this. Because warm versus cool looks good on a painting. However, why it happens? To be able to justify it in an environment, this is why it happens. And what this means is that, let's say you're doing a color rough, right? Let's say you're doing a color rough for a magical environment. You know, let's say you're a concept artist, you're on a job and they say, okay, all right, I need 15 color roughs by the end of the day, and I need these to all depict like some amount of like magicalness. So let's draw a color rough really quickly. Let's take a big, nice brush, and we'll first separate everything out. Let's say that I want a lovely like purplish sky let's say so again it's the sky so light value the lovely pinkish sky let's say a nice light value over there i'll create a gradient right there maybe i'll add some like reddish cloud or something somewhere over here nice thick brush add some reddish clouds right there and i'll add some let's say we'll pick over here we'll pick some bluish mountains Again, lighter, because again, I need to consider my environment. Some bluish mountains right there. Let's say my source over here is going to be this crazy iris iridescent like red, red sun like that. So I'm just randomly basically picking colors over here. I'll say I have a nice little crazy red source right there. Okay, so that's just for my own uh, my own understanding, right? I don't have to put that on the piece anywhere. Just like I didn't have to put the sun on the piece anywhere. Right, and we'll say we have... We have a foreground somewhere over here. Foreground off something like a darker valley like this. We'll put this foreground as, let's say, a dark blue. So now that I have everything set up, I can slightly alter the position of things to make sure things look decent but i can alter the position of things but i now have this sudden separation of light and dark and maybe add a character or something over here it's fine i can do a whole bunch of things and then we can add a small little city in the foreground something like this but now this is where it becomes really important because i've set set up on this particular light source as saying okay fine there's a red there's a red source of light and there's a pinkish purplish source of diffuse light so over here and over here basically is how it happens so when I choose the colors for my shadows or whatever, the shadows are going to be pushed more towards this purple and the lights are going to be pushed more towards this red. So 
let's say the right's coming from that side, right? So therefore, these planes on my on my objects over here, all these planes over here are going to go more towards the red. So these planes over here are going to go lighter and more towards the redness of my source, like this. Right? And these planes over here that are facing the upper hemisphere, the ones that are in shadow, those planes are going to go more towards whatever color my diffuse light is. Those planes are going to go to this color, to the pink. So it's going to be in shadow, but slightly above shadow. It's going to go into the pink. That kind of notions. And then in here, there are going to be some occlusions. The occlusions are just going to be darks. There's going to be darker versions of my local color, like that. So some of these are just going to be dark because they cannot be seen by any of the light sources. So in, in this way, you can just quickly, quickly get like really interesting colors. Now this applies everywhere, remember. So I just picked a nice little blue value over here. But remember, even this in the mountainside is going to be affected. It's going to be affected by the light source, right? So I quickly select these areas over here, and these are going to go towards the direction of my light source. So basically, my my method of doing this is I simply I pick what I want the local colors to be, and I push that towards that towards that reddish color, right? I push it towards this red as a source. Remember, I need to maintain the value. I push it that direction. And these darknesses over here, these darknesses that happen over there, those darknesses are going to be pushed towards darker and more purple. Because again, the light that's hitting them is purple and they're going to be darker because of the value. So remember, all I'm asking myself is, what is the value? So that's that's my, my question of dark and light. And the next thing I'm asking myself is, what is going to be the effective light source in that area? Right? And that's it's as simple as that. Really, really develop something nice, nice and simple. Again, this is far away, so the values need to be consistent with that. Light is dark. I'm doing this really, really sloppily. You see, I'm still getting that strong color coordination here, right? A really, really cool, really, really rough color situation here. And all of this stuff, it looks, it looks fitting, like it fits, everything fits together to a certain extent. I mean, this blue doesn't particularly do it, but again, I should, I should be slowly, slowly covering that up. In the appropriate region for this red and then everything fits together because everything looks like it's being lit by the same source kind of thing right and remember the more it's pointing towards my light source which means the planes that are facing directly at my light source let's say the light's going from top right right so the top right facing planes those are going to be right in that red so bam, it's going to be hit by that red really, really strongly. So those sources are where you put your most amount of saturation. Like that, right? And then you can really develop something that looks interesting. Yeah, really quick. Any of you download Twitch streams? I feel like I need to watch this again. Uh, this video will be uploaded to my YouTube channel and also in the VODs. This card here, uh, can you explain again really fast the rules, like a summary? Yeah, definitely. You can rewatch it, uh, but uh, the rules are like this. How's it going, Erica? Uh, so, let me bring it back here. So, basically, when you're thinking about color in general, what are the sources of color? These are sources of color. So, we start with so all color on every object when painting in realism or painting in general comes from these places. So, local color, which is an intrinsic color. So, I'll go back and forth. So local color means that over here, these were initially just blue, right? These were initially just purple or whatever. That's local color. Color of the light source, which is my red right here. That's my light source, my primary, like a red sun or whatever that is. Could be a red fiery blaze in the background. And then my ambient and diffused, which is in this case, it's this nice, lovely pink. This pinkish hue that's coming from the, from the background, this pinkish purple. So again, your local color, your color of the light source, and your ambient and diffused. Now, when you think about color, you think about these two things when you're painting. You think about the value, making sure that your darks and lights are coordinated, and then your temperature, thinking about what's going to go warmer and what's going to go cooler, that kind of way. So in that respect, uh, this is all just small little details. I think that's the most important thing. And besides that, 
we have this most important thing over here, which is, do I have it clearly written somewhere? Okay, but this is the most important thing be besides that, which is the fundamental rule of how things interact in terms of separation of light and dark, in terms of interaction of light and surface. So coming over here, what this basically means is that the planes of my object that are facing or are more facing than others directly to my light source, so the planes that are facing my light source are going to be both the lightest and also the most saturated in the direction of my light source temperature, the direction of my light source color temperature. So basically the light has the most effect on the planes that are perpendicular to it and it's also going to be brought most into that direction of this color temperature. Okay, which means that these, these planes over here, all these planes are going to be the most orange and also the brightest because this is orange and also it's a light source. That's it. That's basically everything. Everything else is just this explanation. And we can keep doing these kind of roughs, right? Because roughs are easy to do and they're very quick. We can pick like, uh, like instead of this, we can pick this nice little lovely, let's say a blue right there. Nice little blue. B-side blue background. Like that. Real quickly, and we can select, let's say, um, a yellow light source instead of a, a red light source, like that. So I'll in indicate a slight little gradient like that to just roughly put in my, my light source like that. I can indicate, you know, some amount of, of green, let's say, randomly. Just pick a green. So we'll have like this this crazy tall like silhouette, whatever, in the, in the background. So therefore we'll have this nice little tall tower right there. And we'll have things going closer to the, to the viewer, things having really close to the viewer. This sort of idea. So I established some local colors, some local values right there. Things are nicely strongly there. So once we establish this, even throw in some clouds over here in the background really quickly. So now what is this light source? What have we established over here? We established that we have a warm, a warm light source and we have cool blue diffused and we have some green locals, right? And of course I can increase the number of locals just for explanation, keeping them nice and simple. And now we just apply light, uh, we apply the value and then we apply the temperature. So the light source coming from the right side. So this left hand side is going to go into darkness like this, right? It's going to go into darkness left hand side. However, what darkness is it going to go into? It can't just go into pure darkness. It's going to go into dark and also it's going to be hit by the blue, right? So blue is going to pull it in this direction. So we're going to go more into the blue like this. And we're going to end up with this color instead. So not just dark green, but this bluish, this bluish green. And the, you can really exaggerate that if you want to, to get much, much more color on your pieces. But this is the idea. So if you want to keep it subtle, keep it more realistic, or you can just really up it make it seem more interesting this kind of way right maybe this goes fully into the um boom. remember to keep your value structure nice and strong by the way at this stage but that seems okay well, this is kind of idea right there Remember the light source over here goes more towards the yellow. So green local, push it towards the yellow, push it brighter. And you apply this value. Yeah. Immediately becomes more interesting. Even this goes brighter, goes most to more towards the yellow. Brighter goes more towards the yellow. That's the foundation right there. And that's how you add warms and cools depending on the environment, right? So first think about the environment. Think about where those warms and cools are coming from. Because remember, see, the thing is, we just chose local color green for all those, right? This is, this is just a local color green. But in reality, there's so many local colors, right? There's so many crazy, crazy local colors. And even the design we chose is so boring, right? It's such a boring design. We could really up this by kind of adding more interesting shapes over here. Like I can even take like a distortion tool and kind of go to town on this one and make it more, much more interesting. Like this, for example, I can make this like really curved and suddenly it becomes like this interesting kind of scene. And then, because I, I chose like one of the most boring subject matters of all time and it's still made for a very interesting painting to me because 
suddenly they're all there's so many colors on there not just a green but they have a warm cool balance because of the environment because of the light sources it's kind of an idea that doesn't look cool from back there it's so dramatically different but we have all this color coordination so no texture no sketch no variety of local color not that, not, not, not that much like bound and stuff but still we arrive at this interesting set of colors right there and we can really up this right so if, if you want to up local color let's up it then we'll say that we're going to add some like reddish moss growing on here let's say red moss will be pushed more towards yellow that goes all the way here and okay, this has to go a bit brighter And then the same reddish moss will be in the background over here. This is red, this is blue, so the red moss will be more purple, it'll be darker, and then we can push the, push this reddish moss over here, maybe. Kind of idea. So we're able to justify all of this because we understand how light and color work, right? We're able to put all this information in there. Really, really quickly, we can then establish a really quick idea. And also we can maybe up the idea of the light source. Let's say it's a very strong light, which means we have a bit of Fresnel happening on the sides, which means this goes more towards yellow on this side. Maybe this happens, right? We have a bit of that, right? Show the light source a bit more. Right? Another idea. And then this is not even without, without any drawing, right? Because we've done not, no drawing over here. We've just done basic shapes and basic ideas of texture. Let's do but it becomes interesting. We could add an aura of atmosphere to this, right? Why don't we do that, right? Because it looks very atmospheric. So we'll include clouds, and even the clouds themselves are going to have some amount of, uh, of the light source on them, right? For example, I can add this initial amount of, like, wispiness. But remember, the light's going to hit this wispiness, and it's going to warm up the, the wispiness towards the top of it. Right? So this side's going to be warm. It's going to be nice and warm. And the other side of it's going to be cool. But everything is affected by the light source. These kinds of ideas, right? With some like nice cool mountains in the background. Like that. And maybe I can include more of the light source on top of this, right? Maybe I think it's a bit too crazy. I can include more of that light on top of this little smoke and I can make it more yellow or whatever. And it's like slowly but surely we're arriving at this really pretty kind of piece with a bunch of blue on it, a bunch of smoke on it. Beautiful amount of color coordination to it. It's fun. Fun piece. Yeah. So maybe these are abandoned buildings or whatever, so you can apply some texture to it somewhere or the other. How's it going, Iris? How's it going, John? So you can apply some texture to it. You can say, okay, maybe they go a bit sharper over here. And then surely and surely we're gonna get this quick little piece, right? And that's because we understand how warm cool works. Remember how basic this started out, right? We started out with green, yellow, and blue. And then we're, we're, we are done with this like, super crazy medley of colors. Basically how a rough works. Hopefully that makes some sense. And of course, the best thing we can do over here, right? The cool thing is, because of the power of digital, we can just take this, what we just did, and now we can play around with it. Right? We can play around with this idea in the color balance. We can say, okay, maybe I wanted to really up the cools and the shadows, let's say, right? So I'll up the cools over here. I'll make it more towards the blue. I can make it more towards, let's say, the uh, the pinks or whatever. And I can make the uh, the blues in the atmosphere, maybe the highlights or whatever. I can make those more into the blue, more into the yellow. I can really switch up the piece in this manner. Completely change the the way that it looks. That's just the power of digital, right there. Right. I can I can change the contrast of the piece. Hey, dude. Thanks for the. Uh, for the dollars, man. I appreciate that. Thanks for the donation. That does help out. And I can just auto contrast. I can add more contrast to the piece. And I can just change the way that it looks. Real quick, right? So we have so many liberties. So 
They're really quick, really quick pieces. You didn't get a notification? Uh, I think it's because I was on the wrong screen. That screen actually doesn't have my uh, my layout on top of it. I'm gonna quickly check what the message was. Well, that's that's warm and cool for you guys. Just a beef over. There's so many things that I didn't uh, go over right there. But uh, it's uh, an interesting little topic. Yeah, thanks, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, got some information out of there. So just to, I, I glossed over a bunch of things in here that I really encourage you guys to check out in your own time. But again, um, if you want any ancillary sources of information, here I'll list out some of them where I get my information from. Hopefully it'll be helpful. So go here, go to Marco Bucci, so MRCO. Bucci's color tutorials or 10 minutes of better series on YouTube, 10 minutes of better painting. Uh, Nathan Fox, check his workout on schoolism and YouTube. Great source of information on color. Schoolism and YouTube right there. Uh, check out Draw Mix Paint on YouTube. Great information on color for realism. That's great. Uh, check out Craig Mullins's um schoolism tutorial schoolism uh, digital painting tutorial is great that's where i get my diffuse light information from uh anything i'm missing over here the color roughs are from nathan fox uh i learned roughs from him bucci basically for fundamentals uh i think this is it all i think about for um sources of information at least hopefully that helps Can you give a crit, not crit, but what you would improve? Yeah, yeah, submit. Go ahead, because we're on a break anyway. <laughs> what is the upper one? It's uh, Craig Mullins. About the number of principles. No, 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 nothing is interpreted like that, Glow. You're perfectly good. Let me write it a bit clearer. Uh, Craig... Mullins. Right there. Focus, rhythm, proximity, size, shape, light and dark. Yeah, but what about like uh, like color or stuff like that? I'm sure a level of detail comes under focus, right? Okay, what is this? Why is it loading so slowly? Hold on. I even downloaded it. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the first one was for, John. Are you trying to put a car shadow in this? I like the second one. I think the second one's pretty strong. Okay, this is a crit for your boy Wabajog Draws. Also, how's it going? Uh, how is Ashley's stream? Iris and, uh, and Erica. Friday, so I can't be in there today. Not bad so far. Going pretty okay. Uh, where's the head of the snake? This is cool. I like it. So what's the idea behind this? Do you want me to just generally say what I would do? Or is there a focus with this? Near the water. Okay, gotcha. So what's the idea on this piece? Like, uh, do I just generally crit this or? I'm gonna go. Need a bit of backstory. He's working on another pun animal. Cool. Did it improve anything? Okay, well, here's something that I pointed initially, right? So that's a shadow value, and that's a light value. It's a highlight value, that's a shadow value. So I really want there to be a bit more difference there. That separation is, uh, I am more, a little bit insufficient, as well as we have a bunch of like contrasting pieces of information, like right there, for example. 
Like, see, the contrast over here is much greater than the contrast over here. Like, this is okay right here, in the eye, in the lids of the eye or the eye sockets, but we could really improve on this idea. Let's do it this way, shall we? So, let's first of all run a pass on this. Right, so we'll do this. We'll filter, we'll adjust it, and we'll shift the levels down, shall we? I'll do this using uh, maybe an adjustment curve. We'll shift the lightness and we'll pull everything down in the piece. Oh, that's my saturation right there. Pull everything down with the lightness. Now I'll cut the saturation a bit more. Okay, everything's nice and dark. Create a filter mask. Okay, in the filter mask, I'm going to reveal certain areas. So this is basically what Aaron Blades does, it's what Charlie does, is what like most people do. Um, I've seen so many artists um, currently, like, like RJ Palmer will do this, just about every content artist will do this. So I brought everything down in general because I want to reveal the areas of importance with the light. So when I bring everything down and suddenly all these areas become much less contrasted, right? So right after this, what I'll do, I want to reveal these areas a bit more strongly is I'll paint into my mask so I'll reveal these areas right here see I'm not into skull but I really like the colors of your snake I'm gonna reveal that right there I'm gonna reveal this right here Maybe the head of the snake, even though compositionally I'd like this head to be somewhere over here. Maybe change that. So we'll do this. Gotta go, but thank you so much for the lesson and I hope I can catch the stream. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I will see you later. Thanks for stopping by today. And I have to do something to unify the light source. So I'll. The light is coming from right there. Then, of course, this needs to be in light right there. There over here. And if, over here, this needs to be in light right over here. So basically what this means is that if I want these areas to be in light, a lot of these areas need to be in light because I can't just have selectively my character spotlight. So some of these areas need to go into light, like this, like this, like that. Real quick, okay. And uh, perhaps this area right here on this, this sky right there. So whenever you hear anybody say, I need to unify my light source, this is what they mean. It means that the light source can't be just distinctly positioned in that area, right? It has to have some, some amount of justification. So I'll do this light source somewhere over here because it's the top right source. I don't have to do it in too many areas, but you see the difference that it makes? Kind of doubling down in certain areas in the piece. And maybe I don't want all of this to be super masked out in the background, so I'll kind of play around with this. Maybe I'll semi-mask it out with a bit of grey. Okay, I already have a bunch of atmosphere in the piece, okay? So now I'm just going to merge that. Sorry about that. Now I'll paint over. Now I corrected my light sources. Now I can kind of strongly observe in a few things over here. Let's paint over this now. Why did you make that? Because the lights didn't make sense? Well, no, because the lights weren't particularly um, doing all that much. You see this? Because, like, right now, everything is, like, clearly, clearly shown. And the reason I did this, of course, you can, like, kind of mildly change that, especially towards the top. I think the bottom, I'd advise you to remain the same here. But the thing is, like, it wasn't really telling a story as much as I'd like to. And I want this whole situation to be telling more of a story than it already is, right? So I can choose to maybe lighten this up in general towards the back. But I feel like I can, I can like, strongly direct the attention based on what I plan to do next, uh, based on what I just did now, which is to really bring the lights right over here. So I have more contrast to play with right over here. So once I do that, what I can do is I can start playing with that, that color or the surface of the light source, the surface of the, of the skull over here. So maybe... What is the color of your light source over here? Um, but the thing is, I don't, I don't understand. Like, I'm not getting the true color of the light source because there's not that much saturation on the uh, on the piece. So I, I get to choose this, I guess, at this particular point. Uh, I love drawing forest scenes with a bit of cool light, so maybe I could do that. Or maybe we can just make this as a strong little, like a warm light or something like that. So we'll bring this maybe over here. A bit to the warm. 
means that all these pl planes that are facing that way, facing to the top right, so that, that, I'm not particularly getting the, um, the direction of your light source. Based on your shadows, I want to say it's like right there, right? But if it's right there, then why is this going into highlight? Surely this would go into highlight instead. Be like this. So hopefully you're looking at a skull. If you're not, please look at a skull. Then all these go into the lights. That goes into the lights right there. And a bit of the mandible goes into the lights right over here. I'm assuming there's a car shadow there somewhere. A little bit of a car shadow because there's no real nose. So I'll do this really sloppily. Right over there, let's say. And of course, same thing happens to the snake, right? Snake goes into uh, a bit more of that green right there. So snake is local color green, isn't it? So it goes more towards the warm. I was looking at the skull, but I don't have a sorrow for skulls. It's not perfect science. Well, you should be searching for skulls then. You should be searching for skull surfaces. So um, either you go to Sketchfab, check the, check the, uh, the planes out from Sketchfab or something. Or uh, look for skull reference in a similar position, right? Because skulls are probably photographed in every position. Out of respect. Should be okay. But yeah, definitely the lack of reference should never be an excuse. Like you can find reference if you search for it. Right, so revealing a bit more towards that that light direction right there. And of course I can push more of the shadows over here. I really want to push the separation a bit more. I'm gonna push that separation a bit more than I see it. That snake head looks so good, by the way. It's a uh, 100% solid. I didn't even know where the head was to begin with. That's a WIP. Rianne, thanks for the thanks for the host. Really appreciate that. What were you working on today? And so over here, I'm gonna simply just alt out some of my highlights right there. Let's push this to more of a greenish tone, the shadows, because there's gonna be a ton of green reflected from the forest, so we can push this to more of a green. This way. Just do that and then repaint the shadows in. Of course, get the foam shadow in here. How's it going, Rianne? Good to see you. Stream go okay? Everything alright with you? What did you do on stream? More burning, I'm assuming? Cool. Light in there. Kind of idea, right? Now, very clearly, we have that light source location right there. And of course, there's going to be a bunch of car shadow on top of this right there. Car shadow right there. Right there. That kasha right here. I'm gonna have this green of the uh, of the snake as well affecting the surface right there. Green of the light so is gonna affect the surface. Good to see you, Rian. It's a bit of green right there. The green right there. Lovely source of reflected light could be. We could go down here. Just to add a bit more color coordination, right? A bit of color under the piece. I'm gonna add the green right there. It looks it's gonna look quite, quite cool. The part you made yellow was actually reflected. I guess I went too harsh. Maybe. Right? I'm just making initial changes because I don't exactly I don't see strong indications of form. So I'm just gonna do based on like what I see is the form, but what you did initially is not necessarily wrong. I'm just saying based on what I saw. Here's that I'm making. Have a bit of an occlusion right there, perhaps. A bit of these little markings right there. So that needs to go dark. What are you doing? Back to, go back to your darkness. Kind of idea, right? So if I review, start right there, and then we end up right over there, right? Much more like atmospheric. What, what you could really do if you want to go crazy is you can really up that little car shadow here and it could actually look really cool. So we could do it this way, right? So if you want to be super Mr. Concept Art with this, what you could do is, first of all, add a bunch of speckles because what says concept art more than speckles? 
So we added a few speckles right here. Right, like that. Gonna add them speckles. And then we can push that to more of a highlight. Right there. We're like, oh, look at that. Look how bright and shiny that is. Right, and then you can add in that car shadow somewhere over here. Make it look nice and pretty like. So for us to see that car shadow, we need to see some light over there. So maybe bringing this into more of a light is a good idea. I love how you say speckles. I could say speckles, but you know, it's not fun. But I have some enjoyment in life. But this car this, so I, basically I drew that car shadow based on negative. I just drew the light parts of it and I came from there. Um, so that's what I would change over here most of the time. That over there. You can make this snake look slickly and slimy, or slippery and slimy based on some specular highlights, so I can specular this up. So this stuff is basically how you make things look slimy. And a bunch of these dots, like he's a T-Rex from Jurassic Park, which is what they did over there. They basically just rendered a bunch of rectangles and they made it look realistic. So this kind of idea, see immediately how that kind of adds a bit of flavor to it. Things are not slimy, what do you know about snakes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the answer is more than me. But the snake I'm assuming just got completely, this is a wet snake, Erica. This is a wet, wet, slimy snake. They just took a bath, so he's, this is a wet snake. Don't tell me a wet snake isn't shiny. I know, I know a thing or two about some wet snakes, let me tell you. Okay, so sliminess, speckleness, what's more to say? Also, uh, be in, bear in mind that darkness, I mean, sorry, what is this called? Water, there you go. <laughs> Hard word to remember. But water is reflective, which means what we see is generally what the water sees, right? So I start right here because everything is pretty... Pretty much in the darkness, so I'm gonna start right there. So we go into this endless, endless darkness. Yeah, boo, how's it going? I'm doing a bit of a crit right now. So we start here with the with the water. Stop saying slimy speckle in my chat, please. So I start right there. Nice and dark, right? So dark and nice and dark and green. Is yours also slimy and green? <laughs> Depends on what day of the week it is. Okay, and then I'm gonna pull from the snake, okay? I'm gonna pull from the snake. Everybody likes pulling. <laughs> pulling on snakes so let's just pull from the snake and we get a bit of this green from here right a bit of that green now i start reflecting stuff on here i was drawing on paper pointed my pencil at the paper and waited for my brush to show up feels bad man now i just reflect stuff on top of here Slimy speckles. Why is it green? Why is it green on Sundays? Hmm. Don't question it, alright? I don't know the answer to you. Okay, some green on here. It's just ran this random shit. It doesn't really matter. It's reflections, nobody gives a fuck. And of course some portion of this is gonna be in light. Remember, we have to Really unify that light source. Haven't you heard of Green Day? You know my problem with Green Day? The lead singer always sounds like he's really whiny. And I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, like it's in a good way. But he always sounds a little bit whiny. And he says his, his Z's a little bit weirdly. He says his Z's like strangely. Wake me up. When September ends. That's how he sounds, like super white. Okay, a bit of a light right there, and of course, remember that when you're painting in lights, you gotta be careful with that edge quality. Sounds like you made it in a bad way when you said it like that. Like, are you out to like just ruin my career, Abs? Do you know what that guy could do to me?
Put that light right there. I feel like that's a bit more effective when it comes to water. When it comes to rendering the water, you gotta be careful. Also remember that the lights maybe are looking at a bit more of a light right there toward the side of it. In in hindsight, maybe I wanted to draw this like here's the thing, whenever I draw water, turn from green to black and blue. Certain areas, right? Depends on how good of a night we're having. Drawn by abs. Am I imagining just abs holding his brush in his abs and doing crunches? Yeah, what a stupid name, right? There you go, we get more of that that water kind of effect right there. If you want to be super special, you want to be super special with your life, you can reflect some of these trees in here, right? This is only for the for the real concept artists over here. If you're trying to get higher, you do this, you do reflect it over here. Here's another trick if you're trying to reflect something into um, something else, just do this. You grab like a selection tool and you go a little bit crazy. And then you take an alt key and you go fucking nuts with it, right? And what you end up with is this kind of back and forth, you know, jagged speckle. And then you just paint that in and it looks like water. How crazy is that? One trick that concept artists don't want you to know. That comes from your boy Aaron Griffin right there. Indian Abroad is a cool name because it kind of it's a joke that kind of makes sense. There you go. Bob Ross. Bob Ross did not teach me that. All right, so now what we got to do is we got to lower our brush with some titanium white. But first, let's clean the brush. Okay, we're done and I <laughs> broke my pen. Well, there you go. Those are the changes I would make for this painting. So we can begin. Uh, we can we can just go back. So what did the painting look like initially? Uh, we started right there. We started from the bottom, and I applied this dark pass with some masking on it, and then I changed the rendering a little bit on it. Right, made it more uh, depicting of that light source. Those are my changes to it. Hope you like them. So I, th I tried to be as clear as to why I was doing certain things, so... You can make fun of Bob Ross all you want, but he's still better than you. Well, no, because he's dead. Alright, moving on. So hopefully this helps. Uh, add some... Put this in the PNG, and we can export this. I'll put this in the Discord for you. Please put the original on there, as well. Can't say that? Well, I can. Uh, even as a corpse, he's still better at drawing. That'd be, that'd, be, that'd be really, really terrifying. I think you were in... He is in heaven, yes. He is in heaven? Alright. I guess you're right. He will revive in three days. I'll put this on Discord for you. You can see it over there. Just a quick note to you guys. We do post everything on that Discord. So if you are interested in drawing along with us, would recommend joining it because all the resources, the tutorials, the crits, all that stuff goes on there at the end of the day. Might be a valuable thing to join. Do try and treat the stream as a service. Value is valuable in the general. There you go, abs on the hunt again. Shoutouts to you. Well, we're supposed to finish this painting, but I am past my time right now. So we got this far. I don't know in how long. This is 39 minutes of painting. I'm, I'll just finish this off stream, most likely. But a great start of this painting. We got uh, quite far before we got on a tangent, but it's fine. Uh, I don't I don't mind answering questions. It's been a while since I've gotten in-depth into fundamentals. So I didn't... But that's it for my time. Let's go ahead and raid somebody. But hopefully you guys got something interesting from those crits. Like I said, I've begun uploading things to my YouTube channel. I believe Dark Twilight in here, my best mod, besides Vital, has made a command for the YouTube. So exclamation mark YouTube will get you the uh, the link to my YouTube channel where all of this information is supposed to go at the end of the day if I 
really remember to actually make the upload, which I generally, generally do. In the meantime, let's go, I'll just ask you guys to stay for just a couple of seconds longer because I can introduce you to more artists on the platform. Twitch is more than just your boy Indian Abroad. There are a bunch of really cool artists on here that I would highly, highly recommend you guys check out. And in this case, who are we going to raid? Bonnie, what the fuck? Have I unfollowed her again? Or is she just not streaming? Where to go? This goddamn bag. Every time I want to raid her, she's just offline. Alright, what's our alternative? <laughs> okay, we got Paint with Jade, we got Shay Shay Face, Sam Peterson, Asher East. Hmm, Asher East is so goddamn good. She's at 61, she's doing fine. She's done? What do you mean she's done? She can't be done. Ellie Pop is uh, on there as well. Proper. Oh, Proper is doing something. He's doing like visual ASMR or something. She was on earlier? That's weird. She was streams for way longer than I do. How about we give a shout out to somebody that's a little bit smaller? Bob Ross is on? Nah, me and him don't get along anymore. I can tell, he never responds to my DMs. Let's rate Kyle. Kyle is somebody that jumps in every now and again into my stream. The smaller streamer. So let's give some love to the smaller streamers today. Kyle? Eric? I've rated Eric not that long ago, I don't think. This bag became my top emote, it's a great emote. Alright guys, say hi to Kai for me. Kai? Kyle for me. Uh, we really appreciate uh, his continued support of our channel. He's a little bit smaller than us, so it makes sense for us to go say hi to him. So make sure you raid hard and make sure you follow him when you get there. I think he's a pretty good artist. And definitely I think he's doing studies as well, so you can join in on that. Um, you know, choose to. But if not, I will catch you tomorrow for some more streams. Hopefully I can stream tomorrow. I will uh, try my darnest to do so. But otherwise, I will catch you tomorrow for some... Or catch you the day after, rather, for some more studies. See you until then. Good night.